Number 5. Something falling over Montana. It seems a week's worth of sightings of strange crafts flying over the US and Canada just wasn't enough to fill anyone's appetite for UFO content. There's always something strange afoot or something strange falling from the sky. Just this week over Billings, Montana, residents have been concerned after something mysterious fell from the sky. Footage captured recently shows trails of orange smoke, thick falling from the sky. Residents have been left in the dark without much official answer as to what had happened and if this object was connected to these other objects that have been shot down at all. Luckily, through the internet, we're able to take a look at Billings residents' thoughts and concerns through it. On a Reddit thread dedicated to the sighting, multiple users recorded some strange going ons around the city. Multiple posters reported that there was an increased military presence, with loads of reports of seeing military aircraft flying around overhead for days prior and after. Residents of Billings on a Facebook group asking questions about it noted an increase of unmarked black SUVs around the area as well. Could this be a little cover up? Do we have a development of a modern day Roswell on our hands? It's definitely a bit odd amidst all that's currently going on with strange UFO sightings. We haven't really heard so much as a word about this on mainstream news stations or maybe they think we've all just had enough of UFO coverage. Well, not us. Not Top 5 Scary. Personally, I'll be watching this with great interest. So I'll pass this one on to you guys though. What do we think exactly is going on here? Any Montana natives who might be able to help us out just a little bit? Because it strikes me as extremely odd. What do we think here? Alien craft? Recovered drone? Military testing? Glitch in the matrix? Mothman? All of these are seeming equally likely right now. And if you just cannot get enough UFO footage, hey, don't worry, neither can we. We've got videos on UFOs, aliens, NASA conspiracies and cover-ups, and tons of true stories absolutely out of this world. Not your scene? No problem. We got loads on the channel and something scary for the whole family. So take a look, subscribe, and stay scared. But stay watching this video because I got more UFOs for you. Number four, the floating beehive. Now our next clip's origins is a little bit disputed and it's a bit of a mystery as to when and where exactly it was sighted. But what most people can agree on is just how bizarre this footage is. So why don't you take a look with me. This object has been alleged to have been spotted over Denver but it's also been alleged to have been seen over Spain. Entirely possible it's been over both. This footage has been stabilized and cleaned up as much as possible to try and provide a clear look at whatever is floating around up there and well, I have no idea whatsoever. It kind of looks like a floating beehive that almost seems like it's got a combustion inside of it. It looks like something is erupting in a flame. And maybe it's just me and my own tired eyes, but it almost looks like whatever this thing is, is twisting shape and contorting midair in a way that almost makes it seem organic. Now, what I like about this clip is how different whatever this thing is looks like compared to most UFO UAP footage I've seen out there. More than a few commenters pointed out that they think it looks like a stone face with a bunch referencing that one episode of Rick and Morty with all the giant alien heads that come to Earth and, and they do the Get Swifty song. It's a good one. It's a good one, to be fair. Definitely a fair comparison. Unfortunately, even with stabilization and enhancement and cleaning up the video, it's still extremely difficult to ascertain just what exactly it is we're dealing with here. It doesn't seem human in origin, and it definitely seems like it's something that could have been out of this world. So, if anyone's got any insight onto this thing, please point us towards it. The Customs and Border Patrol have released 10 videos, each one accompanied by a detailed report. These reports spanning 387 pages include news extracts and first-hand accounts of encounters with unidentified aerial phenomena. To give you a bit of insight, Chris Mellon, who served previously as a Secretary of Defense for Intelligence Officials, believes these videos will help us all understand why these mysterious phenomena have become a matter matter of national security concern. He explains that these videos and reports are not meant to scare the public, but rather to inform them of potential threats that may be lurking in our skies. He also mentions that while some of these encounters can be explained by natural or man-made occurrences, there are still many cases that remain unexplained. 
On top of that, the release of these videos has sparked a debate among experts and the general public. Some believe that these phenomena could have extraterrestrial origins while others argue for more rational explanations. Regardless of one's beliefs, there's no denying the significance of these videos and reports in shedding light on this intriguing topic. Moreover, with advanced technology becoming increasingly accessible to the public, more people are able to capture footage of unidentified aerial phenomena. This has led to a growing interest in the subject and an increase in reported sightings. The release of these videos by the Customs and Border Patrol is just one example of how government agencies are taking this matter seriously and working towards finding answers. The public's fascination with UFOs and extraterrestrial life has only grown over the years. With popular culture constantly referencing aliens and sightings, it's no surprise that these videos have caught the attention of so many. Some may argue that these videos and reports are simply fueling conspiracy theories, but others see them as a step towards uncovering the truth. In addition to the release of these videos, the government has also taken steps towards establishing a formal process for reporting and investigating UFO sightings. This shows a shift in attitude towards the topic and a recognition of its importance. It's clear that there is still much to be learned and understood about these mysterious phenomena, but with continued efforts from both government agencies and the public, we may one day have answers. However, the question remains, why is there such a strong interest in ETs and UFOs? One answer could lie in our inherent human desire to explore and understand the universe. We're naturally curious beings, always seeking answers, especially to the unexplained. There's also a certain thrill attached to the idea of being on the cusp of a great discovery that could change our understanding of life and our place in the universe. Right? And lastly, we have one more fascinating thing to bring to your attention today. NASA shared an intriguing video during a discussion about UFOs. The footage presents what appears to be an unidentified spherical object in flight. Now here's where it gets even more interesting. Military officials have come forward stating they're at a loss. They simply cannot explain the nature of this object. So what do you think it could be? Could it be a top secret military aircraft that is still in its testing phases? Or could it possibly be an extraterrestrial spacecraft that has stumbled upon our planet? Planet. These are just a couple of the theories floating around regarding this mysterious object, but this isn't the first time something like this has happened. In fact, there have been many numerous reports of UFO sightings over the years, with many being dismissed as hoaxes or natural phenomena. However, there are also those that have been left unexplained and continue to baffle scientists and civilians alike. One of the most well-known cases is the Roswell incident in 1947, where a mysterious object crashed near Roswell, New Mexico. The official explanation by the military was that it was a weather balloon but many believe it was actually a crashed alien spacecraft. This event sparked widespread interest in the topic of UFOs and has fueled numerous conspiracy theories. So what can we expect in the future? With advancements in technology and space exploration, it's possible that we may finally have concrete answers about these sightings. Who knows what else we'll find? Number five, Japan sighting. Our first sighting comes to us from Japan, where a man looked out his window one day in time to see an amazing sight, only for it to disappear appear before he could get his family to look at it. The following is his story as he related it. My name is Tatsumi Tanaka. I am 42 years old and the owner of a beauty parlor in Anaka City, Gunma Prefecture. Last Sunday, I saw a UFO and it was the first time such a shocking matter happened to me. I never believed that I would have such an experience, but surprisingly, it happened to me. I was on the second floor of my house and casually looking out the east window when I caught sight of a a white object, rather big, the shape impossible to describe, rising softly and perpendicularly from the surface of the ground. We see Mount Akagi in the northeast direction, and it was in this direction that the UFO rose, but I could not tell how far away it was. It was about 10 o'clock in the morning. I wondered what it was. I thought at first sight it must be an airship or a balloon. I strained my eyes to see better, but could not understand what it was. After rising straight up, it stayed for a while at a constant height and seemed to become blurred outside. It then turned into the oval shape that is familiar to us from TV or magazines. It was the same object, but not the same shape as before, but the outline was not clear. Soon after, it moved to the right at fast speed. It looked like a low altitude flight, but it all happened so quickly, and then it just disappeared into the cloudless blue sky. I was so shocked, I fell out of my mind. This thing was so huge, but it disappeared just in a moment. I tried to explain what I saw to my wife and child who were right beside me, 
but I couldn't. I just pointed and could only shout out in surprise. My wife was very annoyed and said that everyone cannot see UFOs, only some people do and some don't. By then it had disappeared. I was so excited that I went outside with my daughter and searched the sky. But it was too late. I still can't believe I have had such an experience. I will never forget that movement and that speed. Something beyond common sense. It means to me that things exist that we don't understand. Number four, New Zealand. Next, we have a story from New Zealand where a woman was enjoying a nice day in her yard when she saw a craft unlike anything she'd seen before. This is her story in her own words. My name is Edith Perkins. At 8.30 p.m. Monday, I was doing some chores in our backyard. This is in Bexley, just north of Christchurch, South Island, New Zealand. I saw something in the sky, like a capsule or cigar-shaped object. At first, it had a silver whitish body with a darker grey forked tail. While I looked at it, it was just overhead, seeming to be coming closer. I was facing west. The rounded edges, front and back of the object, called my attention to it initially. Its size appeared to be 10 centimeters long, if held at arm's length. I suppose it was about 30,000 feet high, but it seemed very puzzling that there was no jet trail behind it. So. I went indoors to fetch a pair of 7x35 binoculars. My husband joined me and our home care nurse. As we three watched, a very bright light completely covered the object. It did not happen as a flash of light. It seemed to start up and then finish with a burst of light. I was seeing a different rear design on the craft with a forked end to it, and the color was now dark gray. Another burst of light occurred, and the object presented a rim all around the craft, with either intermittent colored lights on the rim, or else the rim was composed of rotating colored lights. These were in tones of reddish orange. This object then flew out over Pegasus Bay towards the northeast. In the middle of our list today, we're discussing a San Antonio spotting of seven donuts in the sky. On May 19th of 1952, an air crew flying an RB-36 reconnaissance aircraft reported spotting a series of, you guessed it, several donut shapes appearing in the sky, and were able to take photographs to accompany their incident report which can be found in National Archives. The crew of 22 reported flying just north of Sonora when they originally spotted the phenomenon, stating that the plane was headed on a 301 degree heading at 18,000 feet with the relatively calm winds for that altitude. At 8.05 p.m., the objects appeared just to the left of the bomber's nose at a range estimated by the crew to be around 80 to 120 kilometers ahead. The objects were stacked vertically from approximately 25,000 feet to 60,000 feet. And even with all the photographs and drawings, there is still no definite answer as to what was spotted. In second place, we have the Washington Flap. At 11.40 p.m. on Saturday, July 19th of 1952, Edward Nugent, an air traffic controller at the Ronald Reagan Washington National Airport, try saying that five times fast, spotted seven objects on his radar. The objects were around 24 kilometers south-southwest of the city, not following any established flight paths, and no known aircrafts were in that area. Edward's superior, Harry Barnes, a senior air traffic controller at that airport, watched the objects on the radar scope later writing that they knew immediately that a very strange situation existed. Their movements were completely radical compared to those of any ordinary aircraft they knew of. Harry had two controllers check Edward's radar, and they found it was working pretty normally. He then called the National Airport's radar-equipped control tower, and the controllers there said that they had unidentified blips on their radar screen, and that a hovering bright light in the sky was moving at speeds they couldn't understand. Now at this point, other objects appeared in all sectors of the radar scope, and when they moved over the White House and the United States Capitol, Harry then called the Andrews Air Force Base, which was located around 10 miles away. Although they reported that they had no unusual objects on their radar, an airman soon called the base's control tower to report uh-huh. The sighting of a strange object. Airman William Brady, who was in the tower, saw an object that appeared to be an orange ball of fire, trailing a tail, saying it was unlike anything he had ever seen before. Now where have I said that? Oh yeah. As William tried to alert the other personnel in the tower, the strange object took off at an unbelievable speed. On one of National Airport's runways, pilot S.C. Pierman was waiting in the cockpit of his plane for permission to take off. After spotting what he believed to be a meteor, he was told that the control tower's radar had detected unknown objects closing in on his position. Pierman observed six objects that he described as white, tailless, fast-moving lights over a 14-minute period. He was in radio contact with Harry during his sighting, and Harry later reported that each sighting coincided with a pip that could be seen near his plane. When he reported that the lights streaked off at a high speed, 
it disappeared on their scope. Now, meanwhile, back at the Andrews Air Force Base, Staff Sergeant Charles Davenport observed an orange red light to the south, where the light would appear to stand still, then make an abrupt change in direction and altitude, with the phenomena happening over several times. At one point, both radar centers at National Airport and the radar at Andrews Air Force Base were tracking an object hovering over a radio beacon. The object vanished in all three radar centers at the same time. At 3 a.m., shortly before two United States Air Force F-94 Starfire jet fighters, I'm really ancient on my airplanes today, <laughs> from Newcastle Air Force Base in Delaware arrived over Washington. All of the objects vanished from the radar at National Airport. However, when the jets ran low on fuel and left, the objects returned, which convinced Harry that the UFOs were monitoring radio traffic and behaving accordingly. Now, the objects were last detected by radar at 5.30 a.m. The government later tried dismissing the events of that day on a temperature blip, but those who were present have been adamant otherwise. In first place, we have the abduction of Betty and Barney Hill. Yeah, I know I said I'd be talking about UFO sightings today, but this event is a combination sighting and abduction that I just I couldn't leave off the list. The Hills were a married couple that lived in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Barney was employed by the United States Postal Service, while Betty was a social worker. They were active in the local Unitarian congregation, members of the NAACP, and Barney sat on a local board of the United States Commission on Civil Rights. Overall, they seem like pretty normal folks, right? Mm. The UFO sighting happened at around 10.30 p.m. on September 19th of 1961. The Hills were driving back to their home in Portsmouth from a vacation in Niagara Falls in Montreal. Just south of Lancaster, New Hampshire, Betty noticed a bright point of light in the sky that moved from below the moon in the planet Jupiter upwards to the west of the moon. While Barney was driving, Betty reasoned that she was observing a falling star. Only, it was moving upwards. Because it moved erratically and grew bigger and brighter, Betty convinced Barney to stop their car for a closer look as well as to walk their dog, Delcy. Barney obliged and stopped at a picnic area just south of Twin Mountain. Now by this point, Betty had dug out her binoculars for a closer look and described seeing an odd-shaped aircraft flashing multicolored lights travel across the face of the moon, believing it to be a flying saucer based off of stories she had heard from her sister. Now taking his turn with the binoculars, Barney thought it was just a commercial plane at first, but soon changed his mind because without looking as if it had turned, the craft rapidly descended in his direction, causing him to realize something was wrong. The Hills said they continued driving on the isolated road, moving very slowly towards Franconia Notch in order to observe the object as it came even closer. At one point, the object passed above a restaurant and signal tower on top of Cannon Mountain and came out near the Old Man of the Mountain. Betty testified that it was at least one and a half times the length of the granite cliff profile, which was 40 feet long and it seemed to be rotating. At one point, the object descended rapidly towards their vehicle, causing Barney to stop in the middle of the highway. The huge silent craft hovered at around 80 to 100 feet above the hill's 1957 Chevrolet Bel Air and filled the entire field of view in the windshield. Barry stepped away from the vehicle and moved closer to the object, which he later said was roughly the size of a huge pancake. And uh, that statement right there just made me hungry. Still using the binoculars, Barney claimed to have seen 8 to 11 humanoid figures peering out of the craft's windows, seeming to look right at him. In his report to investigator Walter Webb of the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, NICAP, Barney described specifically that the beings were somehow not human, but humanoid. In unison, all but one figure moved to what appeared to be a panel on the rear wall of the hallway that encircled the front portion of the craft. The one remaining figure continued to look at Barney and communicated a message to him, saying, stay where you are and keep looking. Barney had a recollection of observing the humanoid forms wearing glossy, glossy black uniforms and black caps. Red lights on what appeared to be bat wing fins began to telescope out of the sides of the craft, and a long structure descended from the bottom of the aircraft. Now, the silent aircraft approached what Barney estimated was within 50 to 80 feet overhead and 300 feet away from them. Not arriving home until dawn, the Hill stated that they had some odd sensations and impulses they couldn't explain. Now, extremely confused, the Hill said they tried to reconstruct what had exactly happened the night before, but their memories were incomplete and fragmented. Notice I did a little bit of a jump there. That's because we don't know what happened. After sleeping for a few hours, Betty awoke and placed the shoes and clothing she had worn during the drive into her closet. Observing that the dress was torn at the hem, zipper, lining, and later noted a pinkish powder on her dress. Now, over the years, five different laboratories have conducted chemical and forensic analyses on the dress. This wasn't the only damaged items in their possession. Barney said that the leather strap for the binoculars was torn, but didn't remember how. The toes of his best dress shoes were scraped, and their watches were broken, and no matter what, never worked again. There were shiny, concentric circles, so similar to the rings that you would find on a tree trunk on their car's trunk, 
that had not been there the previous day. Betty and Barney experimented with a compass, noting that when they moved it close to the spots, the needle would whirl rapidly. But when they moved it a few inches away from the shiny spots, it would drop down. Ten days after the UFO encounter, Betty began having a series of vivid dreams, which continued for five successive nights. She stated that she experienced them with a degree of detail and intensity that she never had before. And after the fifth night, they stopped and never recurred, although they occupied her thoughts during the day. Determined to recover their lost memories, the Hills opted to partake in hypnosis sessions. Barney recalled driving the car away from the UFO, but afterwards he felt compelled to pull off the road and drive into the woods, eventually spotting six men standing on the dirt road. The car stalled, and three of the men approached the car, telling Barney not to fear them. He was still anxious, however, and he reported that their leader told him to close his eyes. While hypnotized, Barney said, I felt like the eyes had pushed into my eyes, a statement he would repeat each session. The best anyone has been able to rebut what happened was claiming stress and sleep deprivation as the cause of what they saw and experienced. I'll admit, I'm usually much more of a skeptic, but this seems pretty dang real to me. Starting off, we have the original Roswell sighting. One simply cannot discuss aliens, UFOs, or anything supernatural without mentioning that fateful summer of 1947. Rancher W.W. Mack Brazel had found wreckage on his property in Lincoln County, New Mexico, roughly 120 kilometers north of Roswell, sometime between mid-June and early July, describing it as rubber strips, tin foil, and thick paper. The ranch had no phone and no radio, leaving Mac completely unaware of the ongoing flying saucer craze, so he gathered the debris and just pushed it under some brush to dispose of it. This was not the first instance of a flying disc spawning in the region, with several stories already being reported to the press that year. On July 5th, Mac drove into Corona, where he heard stories of silvery flying discs, and two days later, on July 7th, made the decision to bring the wreckage into the sheriff's office in Roswell. The sheriff called in the Roswell Army Airfield, which assigned the matter to Major Jesse Marcel. Mac brought Major Marcel back to the debris site, and the two gathered up more pieces of rubber and tinfoil, with the Major taking the materials home. On July 8th, Public Information Officer for the Roswell Army, Walter Hott, issued a press release stating that personnel from the field's 509th Operations Group had recovered a flying disc near Roswell. On that same day, Major Marcel took the material to his base commander, Colonel William Blanchard, who reported the findings to General Roger Ramey at Fort Worth Army Airfield. Fwaf for short. General Ramey ordered that the material be flown to Fort Worth immediately, leaving Marcel to board a B-29 Superfortress to make the flight. As soon as Marcel brought the material to General Ramey's office, both Ramey and his chief of staff, Colonel Thomas Dubose, identified the material as pieces of a weather balloon kite. The weather officer on duty explained to reporters that ray wind devices were used at around 80 weather stations across the country. The balloons were attached to a six-pointed reflective device that looked like a silver star. After launch, the balloon would expand with increasing altitude before bursting at around 60,000 feet with pieces dispersing in their fall to the ground. Now, after the initial newspaper reports of 1947, the Roswell incident faded from public attention for more than 30 years, until the late 1970s, which which brings us to February of 1978, when UFO researcher Stanton Friedman interviewed Major Marcel, whose statements contradicted those he made to the press in 1947, saying, They wanted some comments from him, but he wasn't at liberty to do that. All he could do was keep his mouth shut. And General Ramey is the one who discussed, or told the newspapers, the newsman, what it was and to forget about it. It's nothing more than a weather observation balloon. Of course, they both knew differently. Now, while he didn't elaborate on that statement, and I wish he did, he did deny the popular theories at the time of any bodies being found near the debris. After the United States Congressional Inquiries, the General Accounting Office launched an inquiry and directed the Office of United States Secretary of the Air Force to conduct an internal investigation. A report released in 1994 concluded that the material recovered in 1947 was likely, keyword here, debris from Project Mogul, a military surveillance program employing high-altitude balloons in classified portions of an unclassified New York University project by atmospheric researchers. A scholarly consensus emerged concluding that the military had decided to conceal the true purpose of the crash device, allegedly nuclear test monitoring, and instead inform the public that the crash was of a weather balloon. The balloon had allegedly been launched from Alamogordo, I'm so sorry, Army Airfield a month earlier, carrying a radar reflector and classified Project Mogul sensors for experimental monitoring of Soviet nuclear testing. The Air Force reports were dismissed by UFO experts as being either disinformation or simply implausible. 
yeah. Now, the scary part about all of this for me is counting how many times the government has changed its tale, expecting the general public to believe them each time. Which story do you believe? In fourth place, we have an anonymous report from 2013 from Athens, Texas. A retired military firefighter and commercial pilot, who was also a former astronaut, submitted his account of what happened around 10.15 p.m. on the evening of July 5th, 2013, to the National UFO Reporting Center, also known as New Fork. He reported that he and his family were sitting outside, and when he looked up into the sky, he observed a fairly large orange glowing orb moving rapidly overhead at around 90 degrees of elevation. A minute or two later, his whole family spotted a group of three similar objects along the same flight path as the first one. The objects allegedly gave off no sound and seemed to glow from atmospheric heating. He and his family attempted to record the objects using their iPhones, although the grainy dark video was of no evidential use. A direct quote from him reads, They moved much faster than orbital satellites, like the International Space Station, or airplanes, but much slower than meteors, and did not change brightness as a meteor would upon entering the atmosphere. So, if a former astronaut and pilot has no explanation for what you witnessed, what the heck was it? Number three, the floating cigar. I got another bit of stabilized footage of something strange in the air from Reddit for you. Check out our next clip. And may I say a big thank you to the folks out there who are stabilizing their UFO footage. That is leaps and bounds ahead of what we've been doing with UFO stuff for years. No wonder we're making such strides in recent years. This clip was posted to Reddit from a user whose account has now been deleted. Hmm. Deleted by choice or silenced. Maybe clear your browser history after watching this video, just to be safe. Hey, you should probably do that anyway. I'm not judging you, but you know, make sure. Anyway, let's get to the clip. Take a look. This is definitely one of the more bizarre UFO clips I've seen in a minute, and I spend literally all day in an office watching bizarre UFO clips, so I think that ought to count for something. When you think of a UFO, you kind of think of a flying saucer, little cute little dome up top. Or maybe you think of like a cool sci-fi looking fighter jet, but I think very seldom do you think of a floating cylinder going through the air like this, sort of hovering in one spot menacingly. It looks like it's radiating lights, either with a seriously reflective surface, or it's producing them itself and kind of just vibing up there in the clouds. Worth noting is that across several reports of unexplained phenomena and mysterious crafts reported by Air Force and Navy pilots, one of the more repeated ones was strange cylindrical craft and a comparison very frequently was made of a floating cigar. And whatever this is certainly does look like a floating cigar, enough to give me a bit of pause. But I also read hundreds upon hundreds of alien stories and watch UFO videos all day, so I'm more of a tinfoil hat conspiracist than the average duck. You know what this kind of reminds me of though? Is that little gadget in Men in Black that they use to erase everybody's mind when they see something they're not supposed to? Looks a ton like that to me. Maybe that was the point of this thing. A mass amnesiac designed to quickly fly flash over the population and erase any recent memories of UFO and UAP spottings. That or it's just like a weird weather balloon. That's what it ends up being like 99.9% .9 of the time. Number two, floating triangle. Now our next clip is another one shared to Reddit and hey, while I'm here, shout out to the UFO subreddit for making finding clips of alien crafts just so much easier than it was a few years ago. You gotta love the information age. Now. Keep your eyes peeled for this next one coming up because it is a serious doozy. I had to do a little bit of digging for this clip, put on my newsman fedora, try and get down to business. But from what I could turn up, this footage was captured somewhere soaring over Guatemala City. In the video, we can see what is a pretty clear triangle shape flying through the air with blinding bright lights casting down onto the surface. This clip to me has that feel of UFO footage, you know, the vibe. It looks a bit like something that could have come out of a movie, which does almost make me feel like maybe it's too good to be true. Of course, there's also the possibility that whatever I'm looking at right now is just a very advanced spy plane seen from down below and giving off a very unique silhouette. Like the cigar clip before it, black triangle UFOs are one of the more commonly reported descriptions of UFOs. In fact, even on the comments of this clip are several commenters stating that they've all seen similar things. Now, obviously take that with a grain of salt of course because they're YouTube comments. No offense to my beloved YouTube commenters, you know I love you. But it does help paint the picture that whatever is happening has happened more than once. Now my theory for this clip is I think this most likely is 
something military and advanced. And if I wanted to kind of get out there with my theorizing, which I do, it could potentially be something reverse engineered from recovered technology. Luis Elizondo, who I mention in these videos all the time, is a former US intelligence agent and a notable figure in the world of UFO discussions. And he's claimed multiple times that he knows that the US has reverse engineered craft from recovered UFO parts and has insisted a few times that the craft in particular he is referring to is triangular in nature. Could this be what he's alluding to? Completely possible. Time will tell of course. And number one, Hawaii re-entry. I try to save the best clip for last and I sure hope this doesn't disappoint. If that last one from Guatemala didn't have you convinced that there's tech out there we can't explain, why don't you try this on for size? This recently captured footage came to us from a Redditor, one gold breadfruit. Thank you. Take a look at this bizarre experience they caught pulling into Maui, Hawaii. If you're watching this on your phone, crank the brightness just for a few seconds and see if that helps out a bit. It almost seems like what we're looking at is something huge being rendered invisible by some cloaking technology, maybe on a loan from the predator. What's throwing me most about this clip is that just the size of whatever is being caught on camera here. Most UAP or UFO videos, it's pretty difficult to figure out how large something is when you're looking at a blurry dot in the sky. But here here, it's almost like we're face to face with what looks like a massive craft. Some commenters have suggested that what you're looking at right now is a satellite re-entering the Earth's atmosphere, citing a particular event in 2008 as proof, though the footage is dated from 2020, so not entirely sure. Some other commenters argued that it didn't look like something re-entering the atmosphere as there was no visible trails of any kind on the craft as it entered. I can't say too much is about that. I am not a rocket scientist even remotely. Just look at me. I'm not giving off rocket scientist vibes. I'm a YouTuber and I'm a UFO enthusiast. If you have some insight, I am definitely all ears. But until then, I'll probably just be watching these clips over and over again, pausing frame by frame in a dark basement like I'm Agent Mulder sitting alone trying to get to the bottom of this. I just want to believe, darn it. Number five. Let's start off with a bang and get a good one for you right off the bat. I Usually I like to save these ones for last, but with this compilation, pretty much all of the sightings I've found for you today are winners. This clip is short and sweet, so let's play as much of it as we can. Posted to Twitter from the account UFO Twitter, from what we can make out, we see something barreling through the skies at top speeds, looking faster than just about anything any human tech could put out. It's got a bit of like a football shape to it almost, and I'll shout out my favorite comment on the video underneath, which says, looks like Uncle Rico finally threw that football over the mountain, little Napoleon dynamite throwback for you. Whatever it is definitely looks weird. You know, it looks to me more like it's possibly some hyper advanced spy craft or military drone than it could be any weather balloon. Having watched it roughly 30 million times over, pausing every frame like I'm a CSI investigator and I'm pressing my nose right up against the monitor, I noticed that there's a white curved surface on the black shell of the craft almost looking like it could be a dome for a pilot. I can't make it anything on the inside of course, but it does give off the impression that the craft is manned or alien. I don't know what the correct verbiage is here. Something else I noticed in my freeze frame play by play of the video is that it almost looks, almost, as if the craft has some sort of writing on the back of it. You know, if it was just CGI, I doubt that someone would go to that length just to fool some folks on Twitter, but hey, never doubt the power of boredom and access to video editing software. So. Folks back at home, what do we think about this one? Spy plane, some new advanced military technology, your run of the mill balloon, or just some very, very convincing computer handiwork? And if you're looking for more UFO clips to squint at, well, Top 5 Scary has all of that and then some. Just in this one series of videos alone, I've collected 20 clips of UFOs all from this year that you should check out. And again, that's just this series alone. If this is your first time coming on in, welcome. You'll see we've got videos on cursed objects, ghosts, paranormal activities, cryptids, and honestly a whole lot more. Just about everything scary under the sun. There's a world of scares out there, so subscribe, stay scared, but check that out after this video, okay? We worked really hard on this one. Number four, Bondi Beach. Our next video comes to us from the land down under. So you might need to flip your phone or your monitor or your tablet or whatever upside down to get a good look at the UFO. Maybe that'll help. See if that gets it there for you. Caught on Bondi Beach by TikTok user DJ Just, we've got a pretty clear view of something strange flying across the beautiful blue Australian sky. 
Now in this clip we can see something shiny, round and reflective making its way up there, tailed behind by a black helicopter. Looks to be kind of small, maybe the size big enough for one person or maybe three or four little green men depending on how compact they are. I want to know if that helicopter is a coincidence or if it's responding to this UAP, you know, coming in to recover it, make contact. Now commenters on the video suggested that it could very well be a weather balloon passing through and it's definitely likely that's what it turns out to be like 90 99.9% .9 of all UFO sightings. But if it was a weather balloon, you know, surely it would have been shot down during that little welcoming party where we were shooting down weather balloons all over the globe, right? Kidding. Another commenter suggested kind of reasonably that it could be a plane because there is a military base fairly close by to Bondi Beach, which would make some sense. Might even explain that helicopter coming in near the end there. Unfortunately, this clip is a little more zoomed out than some of the other ones on here, so it's not the easiest to say what's going on here, but I kind of feel like that's half the fun with UFO clips, isn't it? You know, trying to figure out what's going on. It's like a little guessing game. Let's see what you all think down there. Is this aliens trying to touch down in Sydney? or just something perfectly reasonable. I know which one I would infinitely prefer it to be. It's the aliens, in, in case you were wondering, it's aliens. Number three, Papua New Guinea. Our story from Papua New Guinea involves a young man whose entire community was brought to a chilled hush when a strange craft came to town for a closer look at humanity. As he put it, my name is Alex James. I live in Pilla Pilla Community, New Guinea. About 7 p.m. last Tuesday, I went with four friends to Pilla Pilla Community School for rugby practice. We were going back back to our village after dark when we saw some bright lights approaching. There were a lot of people about, some coming back from bathing, and others sitting around eating their dinners. When they saw the light, they all ran inside and locked their doors, except for a few of us who just stood and stared. As the UFO approached us, we heard no sound. The street lights all dimmed just like a torch when the batteries are failing. It hovered over the coconut palms and looked huge. It was oblong in shape. It passed slowly overhead. My friends and I were almost frozen as we watched it. We felt as though we could not move or speak, because we were so shocked by the sight. The bottom of the UFO was oblong shaped, with very bright lights all around the edges. At the top was a pyramid-like shape, with lights around it also. Just bright white, no colors. It was huge and took over 30 minutes to pass by. We checked the time. When it was hovering over us, it seemed to be as bright as day. The whole place was lit up like bright daylight. That's how bright its lights were. Then the object just disappeared in the direction of the mountains near Vuvu. Number two, Zimbabwe sighting. Our next tale comes to us from a journalist named Cynthia Hind, who interviewed a teenager named Lloyd, who witnessed not only a strange craft, but alien life forms when he was awoken late one night. The following is quoted directly from her report. At between 1 and 1.30, he woke up, and because he knew it would be quiet at that hour, he decided to do some studying for his exams. Whilst thus engaged, he heard a clicking sound. It continued for some minutes, so Lloyd decided to check what it could be. He opened the front door and looked outside. He could hear the sound coming from up the road, and when he glanced in that direction, he witnessed something very strange. He quickly went outside and hid behind a hedge to get a better view. He was able to observe a small figure about a meter high, with a head like a rugby ball, dressed in white overalls. On its back, the creature had a small satchel, attached to which was an aerial with a flashing red light. Lloyd was terrified. He told me he was asphyxiated with fear and ran back into the house, jumped into bed, and covered himself with his blankets. He slept fitfully for the rest of the night. At six the next morning, he went to look where the creature had walked and found several footprints which he could not identify and which he attributed to the creature. When he arrived at school, he told his friends about seeing a ghost in the night, but one of his friends suggested that it was a UFO. Lloyd is now under the impression that the creature is called a UFO. Number one, Australia sighting. Our final tale of the day comes from a man by the name of Patrick Knowles. He was on a road trip with his family when they discovered a close encounter more terrifying than he could have possibly imagined. In his own words, it happened on January 20th. My mother, two brothers, and I were driving from Perth to Melbourne. We were going to drive straight through in shifts, and we planned to cross the desert at night when the heat wasn't so bad. By 2.30 a.m., them, we were in the Nullarbor plane. We stopped for petrol and switched drivers. Sean was driving, and I was in the front seat next to him. The road was empty. Suddenly, we saw a bright yellow light up ahead, and Sean slowed down. As we got closer, the yellow light seemed to be emanating from an egg-shaped object hovering just above ground level. We thought we might be seeing things, but then a caravan passed, going the other way, and it swerved sharply to avoid the luminous egg. The closer we got to it, the more we realized it wasn't a normal vehicle. 
vehicle, or a road signal, or anything like that. Sean swerved to avoid it, and we continued on, leaving it behind. Suddenly, the object started towards us. It appeared to accelerate with tremendous speed. We drove on, and it literally chased us. The faster we went to get away from it, the faster this object went after us. I reckon we reached a speed of 125 miles per hour, but it caught up in a matter of seconds. Then Sean made a sudden U-turn and headed back west in the direction of the petrol station. The UFO also turned around. I don't know how the hell it was flying because it didn't have any wings, or anything like wings. It just kept coming after us. Sean made another fast U-turn, heading back towards Melbourne again, but the UFO turned as well and kept pace with the car. In the back seat, everyone was scared. The dogs started barking and whining. Then, suddenly, we were hit. It shot a beam of light out and punctured our back tire. The back tire was on fire. We started sliding across the road. I realized if we braked, we would have to confront the UFO, but Sean didn't have any choice. Then it landed on the roof of the car and picked the car up. It lit up the car like a microwave. The heat was intense. Our hair was standing straight up and we felt really funny, like we were being dehydrated. It was awful, frightening, like our brains were being sucked out. My fear was that I would be pulled out of my body. I put my hand out of the window and touched something spongy that burned my hand. I thought we were going to die. You could actually feel the car rising in the air. The car began to fill with a thick black fog. It was so hot, and all this soot, this junk started covering us. Our voices started changing. You know how a tape deck sounds when the batteries start to go flat. That's what it was like. Then I passed out. I came to when I heard a tremendous noise, like a bang, and our car, suddenly dropped back to Earth. Dawn was coming up. The thing just flew away, and that was the last we saw of it. I had to change the tire, and we tried to clean out the black soot. There were marks on the roof of the car. As soon as we could, we drove fast to the nearest roadhouse. We were too shocked to talk for a while. Then we realized we had lost a couple hours' time during the incident. We called the police. The funny thing was, they were already looking for us. Someone, maybe the people in the caravan we passed, had phoned the police anonymously. Their report states that they witnessed our car being picked up off the road and shaken violently. They noticed the car was covered in black ash. The police inspected our car and noted the ash, the bad smell, and the dents on the roof. They were convinced something had occurred. They took us to the hospital, where we were treated for burns and shock. Number 5. El Cajon, California Our first clip today comes from the beautiful Californian city of El Cajon. Let's take a look at something strange that was spotted in the sky that's got the locals talking. This clip was captured and posted to Reddit by user Exporius. Oh, Exporius, that's fun to say. Say that at home if you haven't yet. Let's take a look at the clip first. Pretty interesting stuff, huh? Definitely something that makes you want to take another glimpse. When it was posted to Reddit, Exporius sounded off in the comments and offered a little bit of context as to what was going on. Here it is. Three black spheres appeared overhead my apartment complex in the afternoon in El Cajon, California. The objects were unlike balloons, rotating around each other and seemingly unaffected by the wind. My partner, who you can hear talking in the background about UFOs, agrees that the shapes were moving in an odd formation relative to the wind. They were also flickering in the sky, disappearing in and out of visibility, not at all like the metallic reflection of a mylar balloon. The objects disappeared short shortly after my girlfriend made me stop filming to go inside. Suddenly, the spheres whipped around about 90 degrees and vanished. Oh, his girlfriend made him stop filming to go inside. Imagine we had the perfect like evidence of UFOs, but somebody had to stop filming because they had to go unload the dishwasher. Anyway, Exporius finishes off by saying, very strange, I have no idea what these are. And neither do we. This clip garnered a lot of attention in the subreddit where it was posted, getting people chatting about what it could possibly be, although with anything like this, there were a fair share of skeptics. Some dismissed the sighting as being nothing more than a flock of birds moving in on a particularly strange triangular fashion, while others suspected it could have been drone. What is a bird if not a feathery drone? So what do we think, my fair viewers? Something worth writing a UAP report on, or was this something a real bird brain posted? You let me know down below, okay? And wow, I've got you. If you're not already subscribed to Top 5 Scary, now would be a great time to fix that mistake. We got loads of UFO clips. I mean, we're on part 7 of this series. You know we got UFO clips. Storytelling, cryptids, monsters, mythologies, terrible stories, stories too good to be real, and stories too real to be good. Stay subscribed. Don't
don't miss a scream, but keep watching this video first, okay? Moving on. Number four, from a pilot. Our next clip was posted by the History Channel of all places. I guess technically if a UFO did appear to us, that, that would be like a pretty big part of history, right? Still, it's funny to me that that's where I'm getting my UFO clips these days. This clip isn't some blurry footage shot from somebody staring right up at the sun. Instead, we have a front row seat from a B-320 pilot's cockpit as a pilot over a commercial flight in Colombia saw something truly bizarre that they couldn't explain. Why don't you take a look at this cuboid UAP that looks out of this world. Let's roll the clip. A metallic looking object that's got a bizarre shape, almost looking like somebody's rolling a giant D-20 through the sky, comes hurtling into frame. When you slow it down, it does look a lot like a flying cube so if you were worried about the Borg coming to assimilate us this might just be that proof confirming that. Now in the excerpt from the History Channel clip they theorized that what this could be could be a probe or a drone of some type for an alien civilization sending out a first wave of scouts before the rest of the party gets here and this strange object could be one of those drones trying to sneak on by but being caught on camera. Now not everyone is as convinced as our friends of the History Channel. More than a few viewers have thought that what that could have been caught in the sky here is nothing more than a balloon and some strange angles are making it look a lot more alien and cuboid than it really is. So what do we think? Scouts from another civilization coming in to suss out the situation? Or is this clip posted by people who are just full of hot air? I'm getting punny today. Number three, Canada. I had to include this next clip. I just had to. Yes, it's a very cool clip, but mostly it was taken from my hometown. Mississauga, baby. No one famous has ever come from there, so there might be a halfway decent chance I could be Mississauga's biggest star as I spend my days endlessly watching the stars. Enough talk about the greater Toronto area's greatest borough. Let's take a look at some more UAP clips. Coming in next is a clip posted to Reddit simply titled, Weird Object Seen Flying Over Mississauga, and it is hard to disagree. Why don't you take a little look-see for me? I mean, look at it. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I don't know what to say that just looking at it won't tell you. What on earth is going on here? What I love about this clip is that this one doesn't even remotely look like anything else I've seen in a minute. This doesn't look like a weather balloon or a flying saucer. I don't even know where you'd start describing this one, really. This one looks like it's a UFO Rorschach test, I think. You take a look at it and reveal some element of your personality. I kind of see a little spaceman, like a little Among Us guy, hovering around on a jetpack. The way it moves really gets me, too. It seems erratic and alive, less like it's being controlled and more like something's fighting the controls here. Now, I always like to listen to both sides of every story when it comes to UFO sighting content and one user in the comments here suggested that he was pretty certain that this was just a Mr. Peanut balloon being let loose and I have to admit I kind of see it. I don't know if you want to throw up a photo of Mr. Peanut here. I just think it's absolutely hilarious if this UFO sighting is really just a sighting of a giant floating lagoon. I'll leave it to my commenters to decide. You're my best and brightest. How are we feeling on this clip? Is this something weird in the sky? Proof of travelers from beyond the stars experimenting with some new technology that we couldn't possibly understand. Bigger than any of us. Bigger than this galaxy. Or is this just a bit of advertising for a salty snack from the Planters Corporation. Either truth is horrifying. Number two, best UFO clip. <laughs> Our next video was posted to TikTok by the user UFO Tracker. Good, we need somebody tracking that. And the caption says it's the best UFO sighting caught on camera. It's definitely pretty good, I'll, I'll give them that. But I'm putting it at the number two spot, if for nothing else, to keep UFO Tracker humble. You know, I want to keep you working hard. But for what it's worth, this is definitely a great clip. Why don't you take a look for me? We can see a flying saucer type looking UFO floating around in the sky, almost looking a bit like a perfect sphere. You know, it looks like it's got a glowing light in the middle. If anyone out there is an Apex Legends fan, immediately I said it looks exactly like a cargo bot, and you should consider shooting it down for some loot. And someone in the comments said the exact same thing. So, hey, gamer minds think alike, or however that saying goes. Just as it seems like we might be able to get a good glimpse of whatever is happening up there in the sky, a fleet of what looks like a bunch of military vessels show up, presumably just to take care of what is uh, just a weather balloon, right? Now a lot of people in the comments on this one were more skeptical than usual, I noticed, with most of the commenters suggesting that this was either a balloon or a drone. One of the comments posted bemoaning how 
how good CGI is getting saying, I don't believe anything I see on video anymore. Another one saying, with how good CGI is getting, it's harder and harder to tell the real from the fakes. I mean, I get it, we are getting pretty good. I'm not even a real person. I'm just an AI generation that does these videos for you. This clip does look pretty fantastical. The only trouble is, I couldn't really find a location of where this was happening. If this was footage of one of those strange objects that had been shot down recently over the sky in the US or not, who knows? Maybe this footage was absolutely never meant to be seen and I just got the whole office marked for surveillance as if we're not already. My Google search history is enough to have me on like four different agency watch lists. It's nothing but alien videos, skinwalkers, Bigfoot sightings, and recommendations for local frozen yogurt places. And number one, above the Pentagon. And you know I try to save the best for last for you guys. So here's one that I thought really stood out. I like to give you guys a little reward for sitting through the video. Good on you. Someone was recording driving down near Washington DC and they spotted something incredibly bizarre moving through the clouds by the Pentagon of all places. It's hard to make out at all what's happening here, but in the clouds we can see something gigantic, like behemoth size. Almost looking like a pyramid or an imperial star destroyer floating through the clouds. It seems too as if it's almost like cloaking in and out sometimes. Maybe I'm just crazy, maybe I'm too tired, maybe I've had too much coffee or not enough. Man, I love a UFO clip where while you're watching it, you just scratch your head and throw your arms up and go, yeah, I have absolutely no idea what's going on here. That could definitely be aliens. This giant cheese wedge shaped thing in the sky certainly raises some eyebrows. It's way too big to be a drone. It's way too triangular to be a balloon. So just what is it, eh? Something about it being near the Pentagon too also sets off more than a few alarms in my head. Could it be that, you know, whatever this is, is trying to make contact with the people who'd be most likely to be reaching out? What's interesting too is triangular UFOs actually come up way more often than you think. I'd say more than flying saucers even. As someone who's seen maybe, you know, 30,000 UFO clips in my lifetime, that's a rough estimate. I can tell you a lot of the really, really good ones and encounters describe these big triangular ships like this. Now commenters on this video were fairly stumped, with most just agreeing in amazement that whatever this was that was being caught on camera was definitely head turning. A pretty funny comment that stood out for me on this one was someone asking, if you saw this, why wouldn't you pull over? More important than whenever you were going. I kind of agree. Maybe we could have had the perfect UFO evidence footage if the driver was just willing to stop in the middle of the highway and get out and start recording. <sighs> Some people are so inconsiderate. Number five, Kansas City. Our first video today is gonna to be this clip posted to Reddit from user, oh wow, much fun you guys, which coincidentally is exactly how I feel making these videos for you. It was appropriately titled, Weird Flying Object on Security, which is very good. I like when a title doesn't leave room for guesswork. Let's roll the clip. You see that? It's pretty impossible not to. We'll roll it again just in case you didn't. You can see what looks like an alien mothership sneaking into the frame. Now if you saw that and your jaws open and you're looking for a little bit of context, our dear original poster provided some. There was no sound at all and it was cold so no bugs were making noise either. It wasn't as high as a plane would have been. My next thought was that it was drones, but this would have to have been very elaborate because there was 50 to 100 objects and there were no lights. These objects were solid gray with a matte finish and they didn't seem shiny at all. The best way I can describe what I saw was about 50 to 100 gray square objects that were moving in a grid-like fashion, like silky fabric. The way they moved was similar to Aurora Borealis, centralized entirely within this doorstep. My wife and I were so dumbfounded by it all, we would have thought we were insane until we saw this thread. So what do you think, my noble viewers? Is our fair cameraman insane in the membrane, or are the rest of us insane for not seeing the truth? Hey, you let us know down below in that sweet comment box. And if you're looking for more stories about UFO sightings, I have a pretty good feeling I can know where you can find seven more parts worth of it. And if space stuff isn't your jam, why don't you click on through, because we got something scary for just about any topic you can think of, and then some. So click through, hit subscribe and that bell, and don't miss a single scream. But do all that after this video, okay? Keep watching this one. We worked hard-ish on it. I worked hard-ish. All right, moving on. Number four, Israel. 
our next clip comes to us from Facebook. You know, good to have one that's not from the UFO subreddit. Try to diversify a little. It was captured in Hedera, Israel, and it features something truly shocking. Let's roll that clip and take a look for yourself. You see it? It was kind of hard not to. Up in the sky, we could see something that does not look like it came from this world, even remotely. Looking like some beam of energy floating across the night sky. In fact, I'll be honest, it doesn't look much like a spacecraft to me. As far as unidentified aerial phenomena go, this thing is definitely living up to its name since it's up in the air and I have genuinely no idea what's going on here and I like to think that I know a thing or two about UFOs at this point. I've watched 35 hours worth of clips of them. Some commenters on the clip suggested that maybe this intense pattern of lights could be something on a building, like a neon advertisement for like a casino or something, which I suppose could make sense, but I don't know many billboards that advertise with crazy cool patterns like this. Looks more like a flux capacitor than anything else. I don't really think it's an alien ship either though. I gotta be honest, I really have no idea what this is, totally stumped. Could this be a sign of another life, something more powerful than we could possibly understand manifesting itself in the sky, you know, is this a thunder god kind of deal? Is there a simple explanation for what's causing all of this? Is it just CGI? You let me know what you think about this one sincerely while I keep studying this clip over and over again, just hopelessly confused, hoping desperately to get a new piece of information here. Number three, Arizona. Our next sighting comes to us again from our favorite friend for strange clips of flying objects. You know it and I know it, it's the UFO subreddit. Seeing as how we're on part seven, I think I owe the moderators and users of the UFO subreddit <coughs> a top five congressional medal of honor. There you go. Anyway, this next clip posted by user Giancarlo the Great showcases a UAP caught on camera in Phoenix, Arizona that's got Everybody's sounding off. Let's roll the clip and see if you can stay silent watching this. Now it's hard not to see what the original poster was talking about because I'm pretty sure you saw the flashing lights floating eerily in the sky like a beacon. What's kind of funny is that the same day from the same location, Phoenix, Arizona, another user on Reddit unintentionally recorded another angle of the exact same sighting or at the very least the same object on a similar trajectory. And in that clip, we can see it pulsating a bit. It looks a little more circular from here. In fact, several commenters across both of these videos commented that they all saw this in Phoenix. So it's possible that this sighting is bigger than we think or that there's just not much going on in Phoenix, Arizona. No offense, I've never been, I'm sure it's lovely. I'm not sure which is more likely or which scares me more. Now I've got to admit, this one's got me raising my eyebrows just a little bit because I can't quite figure it out just yet. Some users on Reddit suggested that they thought what this could be is something being dragged in the sky, with some users suggesting that it looked like something was tethered and this could be a, a custom drone or a nighttime kite which side note was not something I knew anyone did but I've since learned is kind of a hobby. I'm now wondering how many years of UFO footage has all just been kites with like LED straps attached to the back of them because I'm starting to suspect it was most of them. So what do we think? Aliens? Kites? <laughs> Either is possible really. Number two, Metapod. Our next clip comes to us from Instagram with the pretty funny caption Metapod strikes again. You'll see what I mean in a moment. But I will say, this is basic stuff. Everybody knows Metapod can only use Harden. Zero out of 10. Go back. Do a lap. Now we featured clips from this particular UAP or style of UAP before on this channel, maybe the brand or whoever manufactures these crafts. So it's fitting that the caption is Metapod Strikes Again. Well, this particular thing baffled me the last time I talked about it and it's baffling us again all the way here. So here it is one more time. Let's roll that clip for you. Now a quick aside for my viewership who aren't big gamers out there, Metapod is a Pokemon that's shaped like a cocoon and I can definitely see where this Metapod comparison comes from. That's definitely what this creature looks like, like some sort of strange cocoon. It seems organic to me in a very weird way, you know? As if unlike a lot of other UAP sightings, this thing is something that's actually alive on its own. It almost looks like it moves a little, you know? Like it wiggles just a little bit, like it's got a little jiggle to it. Are you following me with this? I also feel like it looks a bit like a floating beehive. Maybe this thing is kind of like a Rorschach test. You see what you want to see. Now the fact that this thing keeps popping up with different sightings definitely has me very curious as to what it could possibly 
possibly be. Also, if there's any Rick and Morty fans out there, I swear this thing has like the exact same silhouette as the giant head that appears in the Get Swifty episode that asks humanity to show it what it's got. Maybe that's why this thing keeps coming back. We haven't shown it what we've got yet, and nobody has performed Get Swifty for it. So maybe get on that, and maybe we can appease this thing. Number one, Sean Cahill. Our final clip for us today comes to us from Sean Cahill, a UAP enthusiast and a former Navy serviceman who is a veteran of 20 years, who in his retirement has become a decently big name in the UFO community as we set out there to look for the truth. Why don't you take a look at this clip he posted on Twitter and see if you can spot the UAP hovering up above. They'll circle it in red too, don't worry. <laughs> now we get a beautiful look at a mountain range, looks like a Windows XP background and something very strange floating slowly moving across the horizon. Something flat looking like a disc, looking like a real classic flying saucer looking thing straight out of the movies. Now, at first glance, it's definitely got my attention because it's not often you get UAP clips that are this broad in daylight and this clear in view. I'm used to somebody shaking it around like they put their phone in the drying machine. Now, as always with stuff like this, I like to call attention to the more skeptical side of things because I think that gives us an air of credibility. More than a few people on Reddit suggested that this really could be something as uninteresting as just a plane moving slowly through the horizon. and. Looking at something like a short takeoff and landing private plane, it definitely seems like it would be very easy to make that mistake. But I personally want to believe that a 20 year Navy vet would know what a civilian plane would look like. So as always, my ghouls and goblins, I'm tossing this one over to you. My gang in the comments, what do we think? Could this be an alien presence caught on camera? Or is this just a plain hoax? Plain, like like plain, that's a, that's a little pun for you. That one's just for the scholars. You're gonna get that on the car ride home. Number five, alien gate crashers. Our first story comes from a man in Zimbabwe who was asleep one night when he woke up to see an alien craft that seemingly had no trouble passing through solid objects. This is his recollection of the event. My name is Johan Reitman, and I farm near Feathersdorp, 150 kilometers from Herer. I am 31 years old. On the 5th of February, I woke up from a bad dream just after midnight, when I heard a car go past. I got up and looked out of the bedroom window, which faces the front of the farm. I watched as two cars passed each other, a strange sight as there are usually few vehicles to be seen, and none at night. One car pulled into my gate, and I thought immediately, Oh no, those guys are coming to pinch my new engine on the borehole. I rubbed my eyes and face to make sure I wasn't still asleep. I looked at the car again. It was long and wide, and made a low humming sound. I could see lights at the back, a row of red lights and a front light which shone high enough to illuminate the treetops. This car or object stopped at my gate for a good 30 seconds and then drove on as if the gate had been opened and that was it. It was gone. I took my torch, my rifle, four farm workers and my dogs and we went out to the gate. Despite the fact that it had just rained, there were no tire tracks or human tracks on the road. As we approached the gate, I could feel heat coming up from the surface of the road, a really oppressive heat radiating from the ground. Even my ears felt flushed with heat, and my workers and I were soaked with perspiration. It was about 12.30 by then, so when we found nothing further, we all went back home. It was only the following morning that it occurred to me that when we reached the gate, it was closed. This meant that the car had disappeared through a closed gate because they had been watching it when it disappeared and the gate hadn't moved. The next day, I sent one of the farm workers to fetch some sheep who were lost in the bush. And on his way back, he said he saw an object straddling the road. By the time he reached the spot, it was gone. But strangely enough, the sheep would not walk over to the area where the object had been. Instead, they divided around it. Number four, a UFO crash in Greece. Our next report comes from Georg and Pantaloas, who interviewed the witnesses of a UFO crash in Megas Platinos in Greece. The following is quoted directly from his report. At 0300 hours that night, shepherds and some villagers observed a small group of five to six UFOs approaching the area from the north. One of them had an unstable flight and seemed to be having a problem. Strange lights 
came out of the UFO's fuselage, but without any noise. As an eyewitness, Shepard Trantos Caratranos told me, suddenly the treble UFO lost altitude and crashed to the ground at a distance of about 500 meters away from him. He didn't hear any noise, but a fire started burning the bushes. Trantos was very afraid to get closer and stayed in his position watching the phenomenon. The rest of the UFOs in this group stopped over the accident spot, and two of them landed near the destroyed UFO. In a few minutes, the fire in the bushes was terminated. For the rest of the night till dawn, there was an unusual traffic from the ground to the flying UFOs. Light spots went up and down, probably collecting the pieces of the destroyed UFO and any bodies of the crew. They finished the collection before sunrise, and after that, the rest of the UFOs took off and were lost in the sky. Meanwhile, all the villagers had been awakened and had seen the whole operation. Early in the morning, the villagers went out to the spot where all of this had occurred, and they saw on the ground a burned oval shape in the ground, with a cut pine tree in the center, and very small metallic pieces and pieces of wires around the tree. Some of the people, like Aragus Alavantes, collected a number of these pieces. One strange thing was that at the edges of the burned oval, the fire stopped like it had been cut by a knife. Some hours later, a team of Hellenic Air Force personnel came into the area and told the villagers that this was nothing serious. Maybe a Soviet satellite crashed or a plane. They took some pieces of the UFO too and left the area. Argaris sent a piece of the UFO to the Space Research Institute in Brussels. That's the story. If you think that we need more information, we can get more, because I have a very good relationship with the people in the village of Magus Plantos. You see, they don't like to talk a lot about the story, because they are afraid that someone will think they are crazy or something. Number three, Montreal. Our next video comes to us from a truck driver from Montreal, which is maybe why I'm including this video out of a sense of some national pride. The clip was posted to Reddit really without much context. The only the only thing provided is that our sweet driver swears that whatever it was they saw, they were absolutely certain it's not a kite or a balloon, which was going to be my first two guesses, so cross them off. Let's roll the clip and see if you agree. Pretty weird, right? You saw it, right? We can play it again if you didn't, but I hope you did. Take a real good look up in the clouds to make out that strange gray oblong just floating along. Whatever is following this driver as he makes his route is definitely weird. It's got no flashing lights or no quick dashes to hyperspeed, but it's not really got the silhouette of an aerial vehicle. It doesn't look like a plane or a drone or anything. At first glance, it does make some sense why you might think it's a balloon. Definitely a lot of people on Reddit thought it might have been a balloon. There were also several Redditors who, when the clip was posted, argued that this was a border patrol blimp, which I had never seen one before. So if you're seeing one for the first time as well, uh, let me introduce one of the silliest shapes we've ever put inside the sky. Uh, what did I just call it? A border patrol blimp? Ridiculous looking thing. So what do we think out there, my top five scary gang? Is this clip full of hot air? Or could this be a sign of some unknown visitors in the sky telling us that we should keep on trucking? Our next clip, number two, Rome. Our next clip comes to us from Reddit as well. It's a very short clip, but hey, Sometimes the short ones are the best ones, you know? Keep it short and sweet and all that. Let's let the clip do the talking here and let's roll that clip. We liking this? We liking the, the roll thing? Did you see it? Of course you did. I don't even know why I'm asking. This one is clear as day. There's nothing else in the sky except for the flashing alien lights that are distracting your eyes from looking at anything else. These lights are definitely intimidating, you know? It kind of looks like the predator is out there watching and hunting this train. Those little like laser sight things look exactly like the laser sights on his little shoulder cannon. Now what I think is interesting is we've seen a couple of these sightings like these on this specific series. Go back and watch the other old seven, which is making me wonder if there's an explanation somewhere out to be found for these triangular patterns of flashing lights to explain why they keep coming up with such regularity. 
Drones are what comes to mind as always and it's usually what comment sections seem to think because we can make drones do pretty impressive things if you ever see those displays of like drones making pictures in the night sky it's possible. But the set of lights don't seem to be moving too much or at least the train is going significantly faster than they are which does make me wonder if maybe these lights are stationary perchance. If these could be lights from the top of a building maybe off a radio tower or something. Or could these be three perfectly coordinated alien scouts watching from up above? Now some detractors and skeptics suggested that it could be as simple as a trick of the light or something reflecting in a strange way. Although if you're like me and you watch the video about a hundred times like I do every time I make one of these things, you'll see it pass extremely briefly behind a signpost like a single second. Meaning whatever this thing is, it's way off in the background. So what do we think? Could this have been a close encounter of the third kind or is this train of thought just hopeless? Puns for all my, my scholars out there. You'll get that on the car ride home. And number one, Ontario. Hey, what a lovely coincidence because this clip is also a series of mysterious orange flashing lights moving in a triangular fashion. I told you these are a recognized phenomenon. Nobody believes me. Anyway. Let's let the clip do more of the talking. Roll that clip. Did you see it? Those flashing lights shooting across the night sky like they were on a mission? Looks like an incredibly similar thing to the sighting from the previous video. I promise you I didn't arrange it like this intentionally. That just happened. Movie magic. I did some digging between now and the last point I just spoke about and in the last 30 seconds I've come to understand there's a popular conspiracy theory regarding a secret alleged black ops stealth aircraft called the Manta Ray TR-3. A hypothetical triangular aircraft that some UAP enthusiasts believe to be tied to several reportings of triangular UFOs like the one you saw in these last two videos. Now it would make sense. And it's definitely something I want to be cognizant about when I'm making UAP content is probably, if we're being honest, more likely, if anything, strange stuff we see up in the sky could be advanced government technology more than it would be little gray men passing through the clouds. In fact, the CIA themselves believe that over 50% of reports of all unidentified aerial phenomena throughout the 50s and 60s were merely people citing the U-2 spy plane while it was being tested and believing that that's what they were looking at. But you know, if you're watching part 8 of this series and you're still believing what the CIA tells you, I can't help you. But is that what's happening here? Are we just seeing spy crafts up above? It does beg the small question, why would a spy craft whose aim is to literally fly under the radar unnoticed have glowing lights giving away its presence? But I don't know. I don't design secret spy planes. I just talk about glowing lights in the sky at great lengths. Well, I think that's about all she wrote for this one today, my ghouls and goblins. Number five, red eyeball ship. In January of this year, a man in Spokane, Washington was in his living room when he happened to sight a strange alien craft that caused him to question his beliefs and his place in the universe. In his own words, our backyard camera recorded this strange object. We put a camera in our backyard because stuff has been coming up missing. But one morning I had the TV on in my living room as I was sitting on our couch. I happened to look up at the TV and saw this strange object. I went out on the back porch and I couldn't see that object at all. But when I went back in the house, it was still there. I went to get my brother to show him what I was seeing. He didn't know what it was, but he was seeing it too. Then it started to move out in the field where I didn't see it anymore. Then it started to come back towards my backyard. Again, it looks round with a red eyeball in the middle, but I have no clue to this day what it is. I took a couple photos in infrared. If you look in the center of the red, you can see something. Looking at the photos, it is difficult to come up with another explanation for what this strange unidentified flying object could be. Number four, an American UFO. Our next tale was posted this year, but details an experience from the year 1980. The witness shared his story of seeing a UFO that seemed to be affiliated with the US government, but he also posits a theory about why the government would allow this ship to be seen by the public. 
I had a sighting in broad daylight in 1980 at around 9 a.m. in early December. My mom and hundreds of other motorists witnessed it as well. We were driving to visit my father at his work in Beverly Hills and were waiting to hop on the freeway in Santa Monica when we saw your classic silver disc. It hovered completely still at about 150 feet or so for 10 solid minutes. Remember, we were crawling, slow as molasses traffic. We got a very good look at this thing. On the underside was stenciled US Air Force. It looked very official, and we assumed it had to be one of ours. Then, after hovering for 10 minutes, it shot off towards the southwest like a bullet. I've never seen anything move so fast in my life. It was shocking, but I have a theory as to what the craft was doing there and why we witnessed it. I don't know how familiar you are with Jimmy Carter on the issue of UFOs, but he is on record as having had a sighting of his own in 1973. Carter was no flake. He had a degree in nuclear physics and is a former naval officer, retired at the rank of lieutenant, which in the Navy is like the army equivalent of a major. Rank promotions are much harder and time consuming in the Navy. Anyhow, Carter tried like hell to get disclosure during his presidency. He knew he was being stonewalled. When you think about it, it's unacceptable that the nation's most powerful elected leader cannot declassify something that the public, the world, has a right to know about. But what I've come to believe is that Carter ordered a captured or back-engineered UFO with official Air Force insignia to fly over a populated area, where thousands were waiting in traffic to get on the freeway so people would ask the questions he couldn't find the answers to. Number three, an unexpected police sighting. The next story on our list was related by a Lithuanian police chief whose officers witnessed strange UFO activity that resulted in him having to make the press rounds to reassure the people of his country. As he put it, I am chief of police in villainous Lithuania. Recently, I had to appear on the radio to explain that two policemen who had reported seeing something extraordinary were known to me to be reliable witnesses and were of sound and honest mind. There has been considerable public anxiety about this matter, arising from what I consider to be media hysteria about their official report. Earlier this year, the entire police force was put on alert. The two officers stated that they had observed a round, shining object on the main route at around half past midnight, 10 kilometers from the capital city near the village of Nemegis. The object was flashing bright light and hovered 20 to 30 meters above of the ground. At the same time, you could hear a strange sound, like electricity crackling, they said. The two men approached the UFO after watching it for almost half an hour. When they were some 50 meters from it, the object started to move upwards and away from them into the air, then accelerated towards the town. At that point, an alert was put out and van loads of rapid reaction force police and tracker dogs arrived on the scene, but the UFO had disappeared. We conducted official tests on the area's ground composition, measuring the air's radiation and took sound recordings. The grass in the area for 10 meters around where the UFO was reported to have been sighted was visibly flattened. Number two, a Swedish abduction. Our next tale is from a Swedish man who was walking home one night when he suddenly saw a strange light that seemed to instantly transport him to his destination. The following is his story in his own words. Call me Anders. In early March, I left a local election celebration and decided to walk home, about five kilometers away. I had a few glasses, but was still sober. It was a starry, moonlit night, and I decided to take a shortcut that led over a hill. As I was climbing, a bright light came from behind, which I thought was a fast car. I moved off the road onto the grass verge, and then I realized it was not a car. The light passed right over me, almost touching my head very quick. Then I found myself immediately outside my home, my home in Lindholmen, ringing the doorbell frantically. When my wife opened the door, she saw that I had a wound in my forehead and my cheek was burnt. The next day, I telephoned the National Defense and was interviewed in detail by two investigators. They told me there were other witnesses. A woman cyclist reported seeing a light at the same time I did, and a couple driving nearby saw what they thought was a new water tower with extremely bright lights shining out of its windows. Later, they realized there was no water tower at that spot. I still have a scar on my face to this day. Whenever I touch it, I feel a tingling sensation and I experience a wonderful feeling of oneness, of unity with the Earth itself. Number one, a strange sighting in Uruguay. Our final tale of the day comes from a police chief in Uruguay who was out with friends when the sights he saw made him a believer. In his own words, I am police chief Miguel Costa, 
in charge of the force at Melo, Uruguay. On March 10th, I was driving with two friends, Armando and Maria Passa, along a gravel road near Tacurembo, when a huge oval disc loomed out of the early morning darkness. It was enormous and gleaming, with yellow and orange lights. I stopped the car and purely on impulse flashed the headlights. All of a sudden, the UFO appeared to hesitate and zigzag up and back as if answering our call. When I started up again, it was following us. I again stopped the car and flashed my lights. Again, the UFO appeared to waver in reply. We drove on once more along the twisting road, and the UFO stayed with us, always about half a kilometer away. This went on for almost 50 kilometers. That's when the strangest thing of all occurred. We were all glued to the windows, watching as the disc suddenly shot towards the ground as if it was going to crash. It stopped 50 to 100 meters from the Earth, and we could clearly see its round, dome-like shape with a large flat plate underneath. There was a slight ring of cloud around the dome. The top was reddish, but the bottom was a brilliant glowing white. Inexplicably, the new position of the UFO made us all uneasy, so we turned around and headed back to Takarambo, the nearest town. The blazing lights of the UFO remained at a constant distance behind us. I pulled in under some trees, hoping to evade it. We then observed a second disc traveling some distance behind the first. They never touched, but they seemed to be traveling together. They seemed to maneuver up and down until clouds started to form. Then they passed over the top of the clouds and lit them up like a halo. Then they faded, getting smaller and smaller until they disappeared at dawn. They had been with us for 90 minutes. We were all speechless, as we could not believe what we had witnessed. I myself have never believed in UFOs, but I do know that this incident revealed something rare and inexplicable. In fifth place, we have the lights above the New Jersey Turnpike. On July 14th of 2001, drivers on the New Jersey Turnpike stopped on the highway just 15 minutes after midnight, where they marveled at the sight of strange orange and yellow lights in a V formation over the Arthur Kill Waterway between Staten Island, New York and Carteret, New Jersey. Carteret Police Department's Lieutenant Daniel Turan was one of the witnesses, as well as other metro area residents from the Throgs Neck Bridge on Long Island in Fort Lee, New Jersey, near the George Washington Bridge. Air traffic controllers initially denied that any airplanes, military jets, or space flights could have caused the mysterious lights. A national weather meteorologist could find nothing in the weather to also explain those lights. Luckily, when there's something strange in one's neighborhood, one can always call New York Strange Phenomena Investigators or NYSPI. No, 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 no Ghostbusters here. This band of inquisitive minds claim to have discovered the FAA radar report from Newark International Airport on the night in question that indicates an enormous number of airborne objects without transponders beginning at around 10.31 p.m. and ending at 12.51 a.m. EST. At least 15 people contacted the police department to report the strange lights, but Durant and other police officers are at a loss to explain just what it was hub in their skies. Here's the thing, it's been 22 years since that incident now, and if there weren't any military folks in the air and so many witnesses saw this, I'm leaning towards an other on this. In fourth place, we have the Alderney UFO sighting. On April 23rd of 2007, Ray Bauer, a 50-year-old pilot with 18 years flying experience, reported seeing a cigar-shaped brilliant white light in the sky. Now, he first thought that it was reflected light from greenhouses on the nearby island of Guernsey before realizing it was a stationary object, approximately the size of a Boeing 737, at an altitude of around 2,000 feet and at a distance of roughly 40 miles. Bauer said that he approached the light and looked at it through his binoculars. He also said he saw a second object moving in formation with the first set of light, later stating it was around closer to the island of Gorinsny. He said the UFO was clearly visual for approximately nine minutes. After landing in Alderney, Bauer made an official report to the Civil Aviation Authority, labeling the incident as a near miss. He then flew the return leg of his flight to Southampton, but did not see the objects again. By the 25th of April of 2007, the British Ministry of Defense had stated that it would not investigate the reported sighting. Approximately a week after that sighting, the MOD stated the incident had taken place in French airspace, and so it was outside their responsibility. Two weeks after that, the MOD released information connected with the report, including a statement from a second pilot. The report of the sighting published by the MOD reads in its entirety. First object was bright orange yellow, there was a gap in light or darker area. Second object was identical. Several passengers on his aircraft had noticed the light, one of whom described it as sunlight colored. In 2021, he said it was a very sharply defined solid bright yellow gold object with a couple of black bands on the side that were kind of shimmering. Two passengers reported seeing the light to the Evening Standard, one of them describing it as an orange light, kind of like an elongated oval. Patrick Patterson, a 
pilot from the Channel Islands airline Blue Island reported that he saw a similarly described object in the same approximate position. It was later reported that this pilot saw an object behind him to his left at around 1950 feet. One interpretation of this event was that this was an atmospheric phenomenon. Despite the pilot's openness about the incident, the cooperation of the military, and countless eyewitness reports from passengers and people on the ground, the incident remains a total mystery. I'm just saying there are too many witnesses for this to be anything fake. Number three, father and son UFO bonding. Next, we have a story from Nova Scotia where a young man saw an alien craft and panicked. He thought that no one would believe him until his father told him about his own close encounter from years before. Here is his story. My living room at the time had a window above me behind the TV. So I am watching TV. I don't remember what exactly. It was about 2.30 or 3 a.m. at this point. My father got up to use the washroom and went back to bed. I got up to get a drink and saw something out of the corner of my eye, outside the window and above the high school. I literally could walk outside my house, take two steps, and I was on school property. I see this light above the school. I figured it was a meteor shower or space junk. I grabbed the binoculars. I looked out the window to see if I could see it. I couldn't really get a good look. It was too blurry through the window. So I went outside to have a look. It was not very bright in my small town. I look out towards the school. I see something I can only describe as a ball metal, almost like a flowing liquid metal. But to my eyes, it seemed like it was taking the form of a sphere, condensing in on itself from time to time and rippling, as if the surface rippled like water. The light from it appeared that way. It was circular, bright, white, almost silvery. At times, it seemed that the light coming from it had faded, and I could see that it was a solid sphere, silver in appearance. I do not know how big it would be. A guess would be the size of a two-seater passenger plane. It darted from above the school to the hospital in a blink of an eye. The distance was about a quarter of a kilometer, but on a somewhat linear path. I had my eyes glued to it, and it blinked out of existence. It is the only way I can describe it. I could no longer see it. I scanned around the sky with the binoculars, then found it was above a church about a full kilometer away. Same strange ball rippling like metal. I was outside for, I believe, 25 to 30 minutes. Based on my coming back in between 3.30 a.m. and 4 a.m., my brain could not comprehend what I was seeing. I literally thought I was dreaming or experiencing some kind of hallucination. I felt as if what I was seeing was straight out of a movie or sci-fi book. It was like it was darting around our entire town at random intervals, going from one part to another within the blink of an eye. The distance it traveled from the school to the hospital to the church is in total 1.4 kilometers. I snapped and for some reason started crying. I ran to my dad and woke him up. It's a satellite, is what he said. My father enjoyed watching stuff on UFOs and personally believed the US government covered something up about Roswell. but. I never really said too much. He told me to go to sleep. I was terrified for whatever reason. I was so scared after it. I did not sleep for months unless one of my parents was awake while I fell asleep. I really struggled with whatever I experienced that night for a very long time. It was a horrific experience for me and hard to even talk about. I had extreme anxiety and depression from it. I was only a teenager, just barely. I found myself being paranoid. I did not want to be alone at all. Anywhere, in the daytime, I would make sure I always knew where someone was. I was never alone. I was so afraid, I started saying prayers. I spent the next five years looking at everything I could that was related to UFOs. The sensation I had from it. I felt a oneness, kind of, but also so completely overwhelmed with fear. It felt as if my skin was trying to escape my body. My spine burned, and the entire time I was filled with thoughts of, this is amazing, and I'm going to die. I need to get in the house. All the hair on my body was standing up. I was sweating. When I got in the house, my shirt was nearly stuck to me in sweat. My father thought I went outside and got attacked and ran away. I was crying and rambling about some craft in the sky and how it was going to get me. My father told me he never saw anyone so absolutely terrified before, that I was nervous and would look out the windows at night to make sure I was okay. I've never been so afraid in my life of anything. My body was telling me I was going to die. My father didn't like me waking him so I could sleep. My mother, well, was not in the picture. My father's reaction is based off of a sighting he had in the 70s that some people in the town saw. He was ridiculed by people for talking about the craft he saw so close to the ground it looked like it was going to land in the blink of an eye. 
It darted off and was gone. He said it was circular in shape, like the classic UFO, glowed bright yellow, and had a low hum to it. He doesn't really like talking about it. Number 2. Another father-son tale. Next, we have a story from a man who was not a believer in alien life until one night his young son pointed out something in the night sky to him. In his own words, I was in my home in Almond, Michigan. That time of year, it gets quite dark quite early. It must have been around 8 p.m. My son, who at the time was 12, came running into the house, saying there was a UFO right outside our house. Let me add, at this point, I was not one who believed in UFOs. I went outside and my son pointed south and upwards and said, Look. The funny thing was, at first I didn't see anything. But I did notice it was unusually dark. Then I noticed a very dim light. I suddenly realized that the reason it was so dark was that there was a huge craft right over our driveway. It was at tree level and was moving north at a very slow pace, approximately a slow walking speed. There was a very distinct humming, exactly like a large transformer humming. There was a very dull light in the middle, and as it traveled down our driveway, I made out a row of windows around the craft. The windows looked very large. I remember walking down the driveway with my son. The next thing I remember is standing out in the field north of my house, still looking at the UFO, when suddenly it went from approximately 90 or 100 feet straight up in the sky to where it was a pinpoint of light. It just looked like another star. This happened in under a second. We continued to watch it for quite a while when it took off in a northwesterly direction, like a meteor, and was gone in a second. There are a lot of things I can describe if you are interested, but this is the basic part. I don't feel like I was abducted, but honestly, I do not remember how I got from my driveway and then into the field. Number 1. Bigfoot. Alien Hunter. Our final story is perhaps the most insane sounding story I've ever read. It began when a group of friends went to stay in a cabin in Missoula, Montana. At first, everything seemed normal until they looked to the sky after dinner on their first night, as one of the witnesses reported. Right there, hovering above the meadow at almost the level of the hills off in the distance, it appeared to be a triangular shape slash sphere shaped like an arrowhead. It had a flashing red light at each point and they flashed at the same time. Slowly, the craft started turning until it was pointing right in our direction. We all squealed with nervousness. We all convinced ourselves and each other that it was much too far away and that there was no way it could see us. Jason got up and turned the outside lights off. Then, the object turned off its lights. When Jason turned them back on, it did as well. They did this a few more times, with the craft always copying their actions. Then, with no warning, it just shot forward and then came to a dead stop over top of us. And when it stopped that quickly, it seemed that the momentum made the front end point downwards right at us. The group ran inside and hid, with one of them eventually working up the courage to look out the window, only to see yet another rare sight. Bigfoot. The witness kept quiet about this because, you know, one thing at a time, but that night heard bipedal footsteps on the roof of the cabin. The next morning, two of the friends went to the river to fish, and the others had coffee on the porch, but looked to the tree line and saw the drivers of the alien craft. I saw as clear as day what is commonly called a grey alien. Its big bulbous head was peeking out from behind a tree, and I saw its dark almond shaped eyes and the tiny nose with two very small holes. I'm not sure if it felt me looking at it, but it slowly moved back behind the tree. At that point, the fishermen came running back, saying that they had crossed paths with Bigfoot again. Forty feet into the woods of mainly Ponderosa Pine, they saw the Bigfoot. It walked step by step with them, and then it looked over at them and realized they were watching it. That's when it started walking towards them. They started running, and they saw that it was walking as quickly as they ran. When they made it through the woods, they got to a clearing they ran with everything they had. They said it was dark brown in color and maybe seven feet tall. Its hair was bushy in spots. Most people go their entire lives without seeing aliens, Bigfoot, or UFOs. So the fact that this trip to the cabin resulted in a hat trick is pretty impressive. If this is true, why was Bigfoot so close to an alien craft? Is he perhaps an alien as well? Is he a Wookiee? Number five, the camouflage cloud. All right, truth seekers. Our first clip up today comes to us from Instagram, and I know, I know. But hear me out first before you discredit it and watch this clip, and then tell me what you think. User the UFO God, and look, maybe it's just the name, but I'm inclined to trust them. Posted this video recently, and it's been illuminating. In the video, we can see something in the clouds moving, or rather, the clouds themselves moving, moving in a way that almost makes it seem alive. If anyone out there has seen Jordan Peele's Nope, that's the first thing that I thought to watching this clip, and. 
mostly why I wanted to include it in this video. It brings up an interesting thing to consider. We tend to only think of UFO sightings as or little black boxes zipping up through the sky carrying passengers from another world, but what if the UFO sighting was the alien itself? You know what I mean? You follow along? An organic non-humanoid entity capable of changing shape in ways that our little primitive human brains just couldn't comprehend? Look, I know I'm mostly summarizing the plot of Jordan Peele's brilliant nope here, but it's an interesting thing to crunch on and when you're watching this clip it's hard to think of anything else. I mean, look at the way the cloud moves. It definitely doesn't look like any cloud I've ever seen. And what is there to suggest that extraterrestrial life will fit in neatly into our idea of what they should look like? I mean, we think of flying saucers just because that's what pop culture tells us, but it could be anything, really. There's also the possibility that whatever we're looking at is some incredibly advanced cloaking technology masking a craft. I mean, invisibility cloaking isn't as sci-fi as you think. Prototypes for cloaks are being developed by militaries around the world today. Let me know what you think of this footage down below in the comments, because it had me scratching my head and rubbing my my chin making all kinds of hums and haas. And if you like what we're doing here and you want to see more UFO content and wild speculation, well, 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 I have got some great news for you, my viewer. I've got loads of UFO videos and I've got tons of vague speculating from yours truly. All you gotta do is hit subscribe. Number four, Area 51. Our next clip comes to us from Nevada, specifically near Groom Lake. If you're not super familiar with the geography of Nevada, and why would you be unless you're from there, if I told you that Area 51 is located right on top of Groom Lake. Would that catch your attention a little bit? You know, the top secret government black site that technically doesn't exist. The infamous base said to be home to all manner of extraterrestrial activity. That's enough run up, I think. Let's check out the clip. Now, anything coming out of Area 51 is already pretty suspect. But this is really weird. In the video, we can see a series of flying lights hovering high above the desert dunes. Bright lights in the desert sky is one thing, but in the video, we see what looks like them forming together. A series of lights merges together to become one larger one flying around. So what could it possibly be? Drones flying around? Voltron? Now drones seems like it would be the most likely answer if it was anywhere other than Area 51. I'm just saying. Whatever's happening here has to be a top secret. Could this be experiments with technology? recovered from beyond the stars? Now there are countless conspiracies surrounding Area 51, but one of the most recurring and popular ones is that it's where UFO technology is stored and reverse engineered to develop new technology and systems for the US military. Perhaps even pilots could be trained to fly alien craft. Whatever's going on here, the likelihood of us ever finding out is next to impossible. If you've seen our video on Area 51 secrets, you know that they keep everything wrapped tight as a knot down there. Nothing they don't want you to see is making it out of that base. That won't Stop us from trying to get a good look. In third place, we have the Belgian UFO wave. So the Belgian UFO wave began in November of 1989 and peaked with the events of the night of the 30th to the 31st of March 1990. On that night, one unknown object was tracked on radar, and two Belgian Air Force F-16s were sent to investigate, with neither pilot reporting seeing the object. No reports were received from the public on the date, but over the next two weeks, reports from 143 people who claimed to have witnessed the object were received, all of them after the event. Over the ensuing months, many others claimed to have witnessed these events as well. Following the incident, the Belgian Air Force released a report detailing the events of that night. Yeah, yeah, I'll backtrack, I promise. At around 11 o'clock at night on the 30th of March, the supervisor for the Control Reporting Center, or CRC, at Glans received reports that three unusual lights were seen moving towards Thorombe Jean Bleu, which lies to the southeast of Brussels. Glans CRC requested that the Waver Gendarmerie send a patrol to confirm the sightings. Approximately 10 minutes later, some reports stated that a second set of lights were seen, moving towards the first triangle. Traffic center control tracked one object only on its radar, and an order to scramble two F-16 fighters from Beauche Air Base was given. Throughout this time, in reports after the event, some people claim that the phenomenon was visible from the ground, describing the whole formation as maintaining their relative positions while moving slowly across the sky. And over the next hour, the two scrambled F-16s attempted nine separate interceptions of the target. On three occasions, they managed to obtain a radar lock for a few seconds, but these were later shown to be radar locks on each other. After around 12.30 in the morning, radar contact became much more sporadic and the final confirmed lock took place at around 40 minutes after midnight. Following several further unconfirmed contacts, the F-16s eventually returned to the base shortly after 1 a.m. Members of the Waver Gendarmerie, who had been sent to confirm the original report, described four lights now being arranged in a square formation, all making short, jerky movements before gradually losing their luminosity and disappearing in four separate directions at around 1.30. During one of the radar locks, the UFO accelerated from 150 miles per hour to over 1,100 miles per hour, while changing altitude from 9,000 feet to 5,000 feet in a matter of seconds. After his retirement, Major General Wolf 
Le Der Bruy wrote in a statement that the Belgian UFO wave was exceptional and the Air Force could not identify the nature, origin, and intentions of the reported phenomena. The Belgian objects have still never been explained. Look, Air Force folks are the ones to trust in situations like this. They are literally trained on how to recognize aircrafts in the sky. In second place we have a sighting in Alaska. Japan Airlines Cargo Flight 1628 was a UFO incident that occurred on November 17th of 1986 involving a Japanese Boeing 747-200F cargo aircraft. I'm learning a lot about planes today. <laughs> the aircraft was en route from Paris to Narita International Airport near Tokyo with a cargo of Beaujolais wine. Mm. Wine. Focus, Alexa. Focus. <laughs> Over the Reykjavik to Anchorage section of the flight at around 1711, so Five eleven over eastern Alaska, the crew first witnessed two unidentified objects to their left. These abruptly rose from below and closed in to escort the aircraft. Each had two rectangular arrays of what appeared to be glowing nozzles or thrusters, though their bodies remained obscured by darkness. When closest, the aircraft's cabin was lit up and the captain could feel their heat on his face. These two crafts departed before a third, much larger disc-shaped object started trailing them. Anchorage Air Traffic Control requested an oncoming United Airlines flight to confirm the unidentified traffic, but when it and a military craft sighted plane 1628 at around 10 to 6, no other craft could be distinguished. Captain Tarochi contacted Anchorage Air Traffic Control and requested, you know, a change of course. The UFO followed the plane despite any of the captain's maneuvers. The sighting lasted 50 minutes and ended in the vicinity of Denali. All of the data, including ground radar that captured the unidentified craft, was collected and presented at a meeting with the FBI and the CIA. After reviewing all the material, the government officials decided that this was the first radar recording of a UFO. Yep, I didn't stutter. The government confirmed this. In first place, we have the Sheikh Harbor. UFO incident. So this incident was the reported impact of an unknown large object into waters near Shag Harbor, Nova Scotia, you know, a tiny fishing village on the Atlantic coast, on October 4th of 1967. The reports were investigated by the RCMP, Canadian Coast Guard, the Navy, and the Air Force, as well as the U.S. Condom Committee. I had to research that because I first thought it was like a typo for condom, and I almost busted gut laughing. Alrighty. Time for facts. At about 11:20 p.m. Atlantic Daylight Time, at least you know, 11 people saw a low flying lit object heading towards the harbor. Multiple witnesses reported hearing a whistling sound, like you know, a large kaboom device, and then a whoosh, and then finally a loud bang. While en route to Toronto, while flying over Sherbrooke and St. John, Quebec, at around 3,658 meters from the Halifax International Airport, Air Canada officer Robert Ralph pointed out to Captain Pierre Charbonneau on flight 305 that there was um. Something strange out the left side of the aircraft at 7:15 p.m. In his report, the captain reported an object tracking along on a parallel course a few miles away. He described it as a brilliantly lit rectangular object with a string of smaller lights trailing it. At 7:19 p.m., the pilots noticed a sizable silent explosion near the large object. And two minutes later, a second explosion occurred, which faded to a blue cloud around the object. Meanwhile, while standing at the wheelhouse of his vessel, Captain Leo Howard Mercy was looking at four blips on his decorator that were stationary. When he looked up at about 20 kilometers from the vessel's windows, he could see the four bright objects situated in a roughly rectangular formation. The entire crew of nearly 20 fishermen stood on deck and watched the object in the northeastern sky. Mercy radioed the Rescue Coordination Center and the Harbor Master in Halifax asking for an explanation and filed a report with the Lunenburg RCMP outlining his sighting when they returned to port. Over in Halifax, the Chronicle Herald and local radio stations reported a glowing object that was seen by many people who called their newsroom. They reported witnessing strange glowing objects flying around Halifax at around 10 p.m. Assuming an aircraft had crashed, within about 15 minutes, two RCMP officers arrived at the scene. Concerned for survivors, the RCMP detachment contacted the Rescue Coordination Center in Halifax to advise them of the situation and ask if any aircrafts were missing. Before any attempt at rescue could be made, the flying object, with the lights still showing, started to sink and disappeared from view. So a rescue mission was quickly assembled. Within half an hour of the crash, local fishing boats went out to the crash site in the waters of the Gulf of Maine off Shag Harbor to look for survivors. Here's the fun part. No survivors bodies or debris were taken, either by the fishermen or by a Canadian Coast Guard search and rescue cutter, which arrived about an hour later from nearby Clark's Harbor. By the next morning, RCC Halifax had determined that no aircrafts were missing. While still tasked with the search, the captain of the Canadian Coast Guard cutter received a radio message from RCC Halifax that all commercial, private, and military aircraft were accounted for along the eastern seaboard in both Atlantic provinces and New England. That same morning, RCC Halifax also sent a priority telex to the air desk at Air Force headquarters in Ottawa, which handled all civilian and military UFO sightings, informing them of the crash and that all conventional explanations such as aircraft, flares, had been dismissed. The object was never officially identified and was therefore referred to as an unidentified flying object in the Government of Canada documents. Yep. 
That was the name. I'm just gonna repeat this. The government of Canada officially confirmed it as a UFO. Two days after the incident had been observed, a detachment of Navy divers from Fleet Diving Unit Atlantic was assembled, and for the next three days, they combed the seafloor of the Gulf of Maine off Shag Harbor looking for an object. The final report said no trace of an object was found, just saying, Fascinating that no one found anything, and that the government confirmed it was a UFO. So take that, skeptics. Number five, the USS Omaha. Coming up first today on our list of unexplained UFO sightings on camera is going to be this wild footage taken off the coast of San Diego from onboard the Navy ship USS Omaha. The video footage was shot on an FLIR camera, which is an incredibly expensive, fancy bit of tech. It's a thermal camera to detect heat. It's perfect for this sort of thing. And if you want one for yourself, civilians can buy these cameras. They cost $300,000. That's about one month's rent in Toronto. Very fair. In the footage, we can see what looks to be a sphere-like object flying over the ship before entering the water. The Omaha claimed that for days before this incident was recorded, they were seeing drone-like objects flying around their ship that the crew had no knowledge of. This footage was taken from a crew member trying to ascertain what it was that they were dealing with. Now there is some audio on the clip and it's illuminating. When the object goes into the water, we hear the sailors say mark, bearing, and range, meaning that the sailors on the ship were making a note of the coordinates and location where it went in, suggesting that maybe a submarine was sent in to recover or discover whatever was going on in there. Did it even submerge in the water, or does it seem a bit too like the craft outright disappears going into the water? I wish so bad we could get some more angles on this, or a follow-up to be able to find out what this was. Until then, we just have this strange footage to go off of and what speculation we have at home. There's a wild conspiracy theory that I just found out recently and I love, and we'll mention it a few times in this video, about a secret UFO construction facility under the water. Maybe this drone was heading on home. Who knows? And if you're looking for way more conspiracy theories about really anything, aliens, Bigfoot, JFK, you name it, we got all of that and then some on Top 5 Scary. We really have a video on just about anything and everything you can think of that's freaky and eeky. So hit subscribe, make sure you hit that little bell so you don't miss a scream, but if you wouldn't mind, do that at the end of this video, because I got four more stories of UFO sightings coming up for you right now. Whew, number four. Our next clip comes to us from the UFO subreddit, and it was posted by user the Firo saying, This video was taken by a good friend of mine on a flight to El Paso, and as soon as it gets noticed, it's gone. In the video, we can see we're in the passenger seat of a jet high above the ground. And flying around the windows is an unexplained object zipping around at high speeds. Saucer-like object looking a bit like maybe it was a frisbee that got tossed into the air by Godzilla. Now, it does definitely look like a classic flying saucer, like what you imagine a UFO to be, but not as many people were convinced. More than a few people in the comments section for this one were a little skeptical of this high flying footage. Several commenters suggested that this flying saucer is actually little more than a reflection of something from inside the plane's cabin, suggesting that if you pause enough and look right in the video, you can see the object's reflection being repeated in the window pane. Now, there are just as many people suggesting suggesting that it is a solid object existing outside the plane. The trouble is we've been given very limited footage and it's hard to tell and there was no follow up by the original poster to provide any more details so we only have this little excerpt that we've been given. Whenever there's a scenario like this I do like to leave it up to you, my faithful YouTube comment audience. What do you think? Is this a flying saucer soaring above the clouds or just a reflection of some light? I could honestly go either way with this one. I will say it could could easily be explainable as a reflection, but I also feel like the object has a certain weight to it. I don't know, I'm, I'm directly in the middle for this one. I'm a centrist on this video. It should have been the number three point, but it wasn't. Anyway, jury's out. Please let me know what you think of this. Let's move on to number three. Number three, bizarre light patterns. Now our next sighting comes to us from the stars themselves, specifically during a live stream of the ISS, the International Space Station for the Uninitiated. The stream is simple enough, a live stream view out of a porthole of the space station, offering a round the clock look at the stars. It's relaxing and fascinating and I recommend you check it out, but it's also a window of opportunity into a world of unexplained phenomena. One astute viewer was watching the stream late at night 
night when they saw something incredibly bizarre. Watch the footage, I think you'll know exactly what I mean. We can see a cluster of lights moving bizarrely across the screen in a pattern all in unison together. Now this camera is pointed downwards towards the Earth, so some commenters have suggested that possibly what we could be seeing is intense lights shining up from the Earth herself onto the night sky. And while the realist in me can see where they're coming from here, the paranormal investigator in me is fascinated by the possibility that maybe, just maybe, this is something a little bigger than a weird light pattern. Maybe someone in the comments who knows more about lights and stars can help me out with this, but to me, this cluster of lights moving seems like it's something, man, you know? Could this be another example of extraterrestrial cloaking technology? It's far from the first time astronauts have reported seeing strange things up and around the ISS. I have to imagine the International Space Station is probably a hot spot for extraterrestrial activity. I mean, aliens coming to Earth is one thing, that's on our territory, but our big station up in the stars. That's their neighborhood, that's their backyard we put that up in. I'm sure they want to come out and see what that's all about. I wonder if aliens see it as like a funny little tourist destination to check out, take some photos with, who knows. Number two, Lieutenant Gorman's UFO dogfight. Now not much happens in North Dakota. Fargo is probably a lot more known as a Coen Brothers movie and a slept on FX series than it is known as a town where anything of note happens. Unless of course you count the occasional UFO sighting. In October of 1948, Lieutenant George Gorman of the North Dakota National National Guard would make history and inspire theories for decades when he claims he got into a dogfight with an alien craft. He was flying above the town of Fargo, North Dakota, when he saw what looked like an aircraft about 500 feet below him. He radioed into air traffic to try and ascertain what it was he was looking at, and was shocked to hear back from Mission Control who told him well, there shouldn't be any other planes in that area. Naturally, Gorman flew in to investigate. He reported that it was a tiny object, some 6 to 8 inches in diameter, blinding white and completely completely round, blinking on and off. He says that as he approached this strange bright object, it charged towards him. He pursued it as best he could, but when it looked as if the object was going to crash into him, it shot upwards at a 90 degree angle. He attempted to pursue it, chasing it 14,000 feet into the air, only for it to disappear inexplicably at that mark. Later that night, the air traffic control tower reported seeing that exact same bizarre light at the airfield. Gorman touched down and told his superior officers that he had no idea what it was he encountered, but that he had reason to believe that whatever he was pursuing had thought behind its movements, that it seemed to be making decisions, conscientious choices, and it was reacting to what he was doing. Lieutenant Gorman would live out the rest of his days fairly normally, but no doubt in the back of his mind, he must have always wondered just what it was he encountered that fateful night. Number one, Tic Tac sighting. If you're a UFO enthusiast, you probably already knew about this, but I'll never stop banging on about this because it's the craziest thing that's happened in years. The Pentagon publicly revealed that they've been tracking UFO development for years, <laughs> putting some serious weight into the UFO discussion. Besides doing more to legitimize UFO discussion than anything else, like ever, it also provided us with a bevy of sightings from government agents to pull from. In 2004, a pair of Navy pilots tracked a series of UFOs for weeks on end. According to their reports, these objects would appear suddenly at about 80,000 feet in the air and then descend rapidly towards the Pacific Ocean, eventually stopping at around 20,000 feet and just hovering. They would either drop out of radar range or shoot right back up into the sky, which is pretty bizarre behavior. These entities were monitored for weeks before two fighter jet pilots were officially sent in to investigate the phenomena. Commander David Fravor and Lieutenant Commander Jim Slight, who flew out to try and get eyes on it, what they found would confound the veterans. The men reported back that the object resembled a giant tic tac, an unidentifiable white colored oval like aircraft about 40 feet long. Far, far too big to be a drone and doesn't really sound like any aircraft I've ever heard of. The craft was jumping around erratically, staying just out of reach of radars, but not moving in any one particular direction. The pilots agreed on a rendezvous point to touch down and discuss whatever it was they had just seen, but as they were heading towards it, the UFO flew towards their rendezvous point at a breakneck speed before disappearing entirely. Commander David Fravor said it was unlike anything he had ever seen before, and the whole experience had weirded him out. Completely understandable. I think if I ever saw a giant tic tac spiraling erratically through the air, it would kind of affect me too. So what do you think? Any ideas at all because that sounds like pretty hard proof of a UFO. Number five, Carlsbad. In August of 2022, a group of people reported an inexplicable glowing object illuminating the sky above them. They claimed to see red dots appearing, disappearing, and reappearing in the formation of a line. 
The group quickly took out their phones and began recording, then noticing a second and third formation of the same dotted lines. In response to the public questioning of this sighting, the National Air Force released a statement claiming that this was simply part of their training and that there was no cause for concern. They said that the dots were training operations from the Hollow Man Air Force Base, in which the pilots and planes were using flares. Many citizens questioned the legitimacy of the Air Force's response, stating that the lights simply do not look like flares, they look electronic. The National UFO Center released a quote that got people thinking. The greatest scientific question of our time is, are we alone? From this vantage point, it doesn't look like we are. People that are skeptical of the Air Force's honesty bring up an interesting observation. When one person captures a video of an unidentified aerial phenomenon, the Air Force reports it as tampered or photoshopped. But whenever the video is taken by multiple people from multiple angles, the Air Force creates an excuse, citing tests or astral anomalies as the reasoning behind the flying objects. Many find the responses to be odd, wondering why no one is alerted of testing beforehand. The Air Force continues to come up with explanations after the videos are brought to their attention. Is it just as naive to believe in UFOs as it is to blindly believe the organization that has lied to us in the past? Number 4. Roswell the Roswell incident is generously and fairly credited as a pivoting point for the culture surrounding aerial phenomenons today. In 1947, an object crash landed on ranch land in Roswell, New Mexico. Mac Brazel and his son were driving across their land when they came across the wreckage. Brazel described the scene as a large area of bright wreckage made up of rubber strips, tinfoil, and rather tough paper and sticks. Perplexed by the strange assortment of items that had randomly appeared, Brazel decided to take the items into the police. The object that crashed had several crash sites. Others who claim to have seen the object crash land in different locations say that they saw small humanoid creatures leaving the ship, seemingly running away from the wreckage. About a week after the crash, Brazel had been able to collect most of the wreckage, so he drove into Roswell. Brazel brought the items to Sheriff George Wilcox, who ended up being just as confused as Brazel was regarding the origin of the materials. The sheriff decided to contact the commander of Roswell Army's Air Forces. The news worked itself up the chain of command, eventually reaching an intelligence officer named Major Jesse Marcel. Marcel traveled to the crash sites and retrieved the remainder of the wreckage. Then, Marcel provided a public statement for the newspapers. The intelligence office of the 509th Bombardment Group at Roswell Army Airfield announced at noon today that the field has come into the possession of a flying saucer. Pilot Kenneth Arnold also confirmed the existence of the saucer, claiming that he too had seen a flying object. Only days later, the news ran rampant with flying saucer headlines. The Air Force released a statement claiming that the object was merely a weather balloon, but in 1978, Marcel revealed that the claim of it being a weather balloon was a hoax meant to distract the public. He speculated that the debris origin was not of this world. Public speculation exploded with hundreds of theories as to what was found that day. And to this day, the Air Force continues to deny that the debris was extraterrestrial. New theories regarding the Roswell incident continue to be talked about, making it one of, if not the most popular UFO sighting to date. Number 3, New Delhi. Coming up next is going to be this clip shared online with the caption, A Weird Set of Lights Above New Delhi. Take a look see. So in the clip pretty clearly we can see yeah there's some strange lights going on in the night sky above New Delhi. There's a scattering of lights above the city's horizon. Now immediately your first thought might be that it's drones, which is a reasonable assumption when it comes to UFO stuff. I feel like several videos that come out of little glowing lights dashing across the night sky usually end up being civilian drones. However, the original poster clarified that drones are illegal in India and there aren't widespread at all for civilians. And on top of that, the area that's being filmed is said to be in the slums where it's incredibly unlikely that anyone would have access to drones. The poster added this little bit of context with the video. I 
saw this today around 8 p.m. in New Delhi with a friend. It was massive. This cannot be a building as there is no tall building in that direction, only slums with heights of about four to five floors. Yet this building looked as tall as the Burj Khalifa. There was a moderate wind going on and I thought if it's drones, why aren't they swaying? Not to forget, drones are illegal in India and especially in New Delhi. It looked massive in the sky. I wish the camera saw what my eyes could see. It could absolutely blew me away. I've been to drone shows, but this looked nothing like it. Any idea what this could be? Also, I agree. I wish our cameras did just capture exactly what our eyes saw. It would make all this UFO stuff so much, so much easier. And also I would finally get a nice picture of the moon to have on my phone. Now some people in the comment section on this clip suggested that maybe it was a laser light show, but that's just speculation and nothing concrete. Well, one particularly good suggestion from a commenter that did make me laugh said that the original poster should have ran towards the lights to see what happens and investigate up close and personal, you know? Worst case, yeah, you get abducted, never see your friends, family, or home planet again, but you also would get the ride of a lifetime and if you do survive to come back home you get an amazing story to tell people so live a little number two garden ridge our next offering for your entertainment and i hope your amusement is this short clip that was uploaded to youtube pretty recently ufo spotted over garden ridge texas in this clip we can see a somewhat strange flying object that looks a bit like a cocoon being propelled forward, or maybe even a beehive or something. The entity has no propulsion or trails behind it, which really doesn't explain how it's moving forward so fast. Some sort of anti-gravity manipulation technology that I don't understand. Is that too wild to speculate that an alien has that? Now we've seen cocoon-like UFOs a few times doing these videos, actually. We saw them a bunch. I don't know if you remember, one of them turned out to be Mr. Peanut, but most of them are UFOs. I'd say after triangle UFOs or little light clusters, I probably see videos of little cocoon-like UFOs like this more than any other kind. So what are these cocoon-like UFOs that keep appearing and why do they all look so similar? This lack of propulsion too is really puzzling me. Now the original poster returned after the fact to add a little bit of clarity in the comments. He said the object was moving with the wind, not against it, so maybe it's possible it's something like a weather balloon that has been swept up in an air current. That's usually what most of these clips turn out to be. I would love to see a statistic on how many UFO sightings are actually weather balloons balloons because I suspect it's probably like 99%. Another commenter suggested that this could be an object heading towards Randolph Air Force Base, speculating that the UAP seen in this video could be a manned jetpack or a very tiny stealth craft of some kind, which would be pretty cool, or even some sort of new drone technology the US military is developing. Now among other things though, the original uploader did admit and suggest that this really could just be a balloon suggested that he thought it might be attached to a floral arrangement that somebody let go of. Hey, maybe an alien was picking up a last minute Valentine's Day gift. Or hey, maybe an alien had to apologize to someone, you know? Maybe a probing went wrong and a little flowers was the only thing that could smooth it over. I wonder if they'll keep that in the video. <laughs> Number one, the A-10 over Arizona. And coming up at our final spot today for crazy UFO footage is going to be this dramatic footage of a spherical UAP being filmed tailing an A-10 aircraft over Arizona. The footage was filmed by a mobile scope truck recorded by the DHS, that's the Department of Homeland Security. The craft caught on camera is one of unknown origins, well, obviously. So why it's a UFO. The U doesn't stand for usual, it's unidentified. Now there's really not a lot to go on from this clip as the original uploader didn't provide a ton of insight or backstory beyond the short clip, so we're left with mostly speculation. Similar to the previous clip, I have to wonder maybe if this is a drone of some kind due to its size in comparison to the rest of the craft which dwarfs it. Could this be an unmanned craft? Is someone piloting it from a remote location far away? Now earlier in the video, I quickly shouted out a conspiracy which I recently discovered and I hope we can do like a full video on it because it was fascinating, saying that a majority of the crafts that we see in UFO videos are scout crafts that come from a construction facility hidden somewhere deep beneath the ocean from a civilization that predates ours. This advanced technological facility is manned by an artificial intelligence that keeps it running autonomously and produces these small crafts naturally to scout out the planet and, well I don't know yet what they're doing, but something 
alien. Now, obviously, that is a very, very, very tinfoil hat theory. I got it from a less than reputable website, but it is a ton of fun to speculate on and would certainly make sense why there are so many sightings of these similar objects if they were all literally coming from the same factory line. And also, wouldn't that just be the nicest, I don't know, funniest little ironic cap to aliens if we're spending all our time looking up, but they've been below us the whole time? Anyway, something to think about. Starting off this list in our number five spot, we have Project Grudge Report 13. Okay, so I've read quite a few different UFO sighting stories and stories of alleged alien abductions, and this is fully one of the most terrifying that I have ever heard of. So basically, the story starts off in March of 1956 when Air Force Sergeant Jonathan P. Lovett was assisting Major William William <laughs> was assisting Major William Cunningham in the White Sands Missile Testing Grounds near Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. The pair were out searching for debris from a recent rocket test when Major Cunningham heard a loud scream. His first thought was that Sergeant Lovett had been bitten by a snake, so he went around to help aid his partner when he allegedly saw something he never expected. He recounted seeing the sergeant being dragged away by some sort of long serpentine arm that had wrapped around his legs. Whatever this creature was, it was connected to a hovering silver disc that was in the air about 15 feet away. The Major stood there in horror as he watched this creature and the sergeant retreat into the craft, which then rose vertically into the sky. Of course, he radioed for help, and while he was taken to the hospital for observation, search teams were sent out immediately. It wouldn't happen until three days later that they would find the body of Sergeant Lovett, only 10 miles from the site where he was said to have disappeared from. The autopsy performed on him later also only raised more questions than answers, as his body was severely harmed. So, of course, there was an investigation that happened, and many people claim this investigation was detailed in a 600 page document labeled Project Grudge Report 13. But the problem with this is that no official information on Report 13 exists, and the US government denies its very existence. Though Grudge Reports 1 through 12 have been declassified, along with Report 14, no official mention or accounting of Report 13 exists, and the story solely relies on secondhand accounts of the horrible incident. In our number Number four spot today, we have the cigar shaped UFO. Okay, so let's set the stage. It's 2 45 a.m. on July 24th, 1948, and there are 20 passengers aboard a twin engine propeller plane that is at 5,000 feet being flown from Houston to Atlanta by pilot Clarence S. Childs and co pilot John B. Witted. Out of the 20 passengers on board, 19 of them are asleep at these early morning hours, and everything seems to be going as per usual until it wasn't. The two pilots and the one passenger who was awake all witnessed the same thing about 20 miles southeast of Montgomery, Alabama. About a week after the incident, the pilot explained what he had seen by saying, quote, It was clear there were no wings present, that it was powered by some jet or other type of power shooting flame from the rear some 50 feet. There were two rows of windows which indicated an upper and a lower deck, and from inside these windows a very bright light was glowing. Underneath the ship there was a blue glow of light. Light. By his estimates, he watched the UFO for about 10 seconds before it completely vanished. The co-pilot gave a similar explanation and also added, quote, The object was cigar shaped and seemed to be about 100 feet in length. The fuselage appeared to be about three times the circumference of a B-29 fuselage. It had two rows of windows, an upper and a lower. The windows were very large and seemed square. They were white with light, which seemed to be caused by some type of combustion. I asked Captain Chuck what we had just seen, and he said that he didn't know. Well, this is obviously all very strange and peculiar. What has driven UFO enthusiasts even more is the fact that this strange sighting was of course later investigated by the US government, but the results of that investigation have allegedly been mostly destroyed. Does that mean that they found something they aren't willing to share yet? Some believe that perhaps the pilots and the passenger witnessed a secret Soviet spy craft, while others believe it was definitely something of the extraterrestrial variety. Number three, pilot sightings. On Sunday, February 21st, 2021, Steve Douglas, a blogger armed with a radio, accidentally intercepted a transmission from an airplane flying over New Mexico, and he heard a startling interaction take place. 
The first pilot said, do you have any targets up here? We just had something go right over the top of us, which was followed shortly by a description from the pilot. I hate to say this, but it looked like a long cylindrical object that almost looked like a cruise missile type thing, moving really fast right over the top of us. Douglas was able to use two flight tracking apps to pinpoint the exact position of the plane as the signal was intercepted. Douglas said that it was over the northeast corner of New Mexico, west of Clayton, New Mexico. The plane was at an altitude of 37,000 feet. New Mexico is very well known for its connection to the extraterrestrial, making the sighting of an unidentified object far more likely and suspicious. In response to the blogger's post, the FAA released a statement confirming that the audio was real, but that their radars did not pick up any unknown flying objects over the area. Pilot sighting strange flying objects supposedly happens fairly regularly, and there are many similar cases of pilots seeing objects flying over them or in the distance, but then the command tower claims that there is no sign of anything on the radar. The Air Force has been extremely secretive in the past, adamantly denying the accusation that they're aware of an extraterrestrial life force, but in recent years they've been denying less and avoiding more. Do you think it's because they can no longer hide it? Or possibly, extraterrestrial life isn't as harmful as we once believed. Number two, the Lonnie Zamora incident. In the spring of 1964, Lonnie Zamora claims to have seen two people standing beside a large shiny object that later launched into the air with a roaring burst of fire. Lonnie gained a significant amount of attention from the media, UFO organization and investigators, and the Air Force. Lonnie Zamora found himself in an open field after seeing what he'd assumed to be a motor crash from the distance. Zamora continued pursuing the crash until he saw a blaze of fire. Zamora then assumed that an explosion had occurred, so he decided to investigate the incident from a distance. It was then that Lonnie noticed a white shiny object, originally assumed to be an overturned white car. He described the object being oval and likened the material to aluminum. Many theories have been provided in an attempt to explain what Lonnie saw that night. Some said it was merely a mirage of the star Canopus. Others suggested that it was a lunar landing test by humans, not aliens. The president of New Mexico Tech claimed that it was just a prank put on by some of the students, saying it was just a balloon and a candle, not high-tech alien equipment. In 1966, the county's commerce president decided to make the location more accessible to tourists. They installed walkways and signage, hoping to attract alien enthusiasts from all over the country. But the tourist destination is actually not placed at the exact site. In fact, it's about a quarter mile away. Locals claim the decision to move the pathways was simply due to radioactivity on the original site. Number one, the Dulce base. Are aliens and humans working together? In Dulce, New Mexico, this might be a reality. Many people believe that there's a secret underground base where extraterrestrial beings and humans work together, working on projects and researching what lies beyond the stars and what's on our planet. The theory was created in 1979 when Paul Benowitz became convinced that he was intercepting signals from alien spacecrafts. Within the same year, he had also become convinced that he had discovered a secret government underground base where gray aliens worked alongside humans. Benowitz's story spread quickly and became highly popular in the UFO conspiracy community, with members of UFO groups even confirming the existence of the base. News outlets began adding fuel to the raging fire, claiming that an author had confirmed the existence of the base and that the aliens built the base so that they could test on humans. A political scientist named Michael Barkin added that there are in fact underground missile installations, which gives the slightest amount of plausibility to the idea of an alien base. This stirred up even more interest in the theory among UFO conspiracists. However, absurd claims of wild fights and abductions of humans led many to believe that the base is nothing more than a conspiracy. The evidence supporting the base existing is circumstantial, but the evidence against it is as well. Whether a secret collaborative project between aliens and humans is happening or not, there's definitely something strange lurking underground at the Dulce base. Number five, Camp Wilson. So, we find ourselves in a truly remarkable moment as a new wave of UFO sightings takes center stage this year, and NASA can no longer afford to turn a blind eye to this unexplained phenomenon. Together, let's travel to the California desert, where an event unfolded that eerily echoes the famous 1997 Phoenix Lights incident. Now, if you're a fan of a channel, you've heard me talk about this before. If not, I've done 
plenty of other videos on it. Jeremy Corbell and George Knapp, known for their groundbreaking investigations, brought to light footage from April of 2021, filmed over 29 poems. This sighting is far from your typical blurry UFO footage. The object described as a giant black triangular shape with lights on its edges was captured from multiple angles by six videos, with the accompanying high exposure photograph revealing even more detail. Witnesses, including over 50 US Marines, were baffled by the object's sudden appearance, size, and behavior. Like I said before, the incident closely resembles the Phoenix Lights, where a massive triangular UFO was witnessed by thousands. It's important to note that the witnesses in this case aren't your average civilians. They are trained military personnel, artillerymen, and mortarmen who have dealt with illumination rounds and various military aircraft. And their unanimous conclusion? This was unlike anything they had ever encountered. Specifically speaking, a mortar man serving at Camp Wilson during this incident spoke with Corbell and took a high exposure photo on his smartphone, which revealed the outline of, you know, this object. It appears to be triangular, surrounded by lights spaced evenly around its edge in a V formation. Now, the mortar man, who was staying anonymous for safety reasons, described how one of his companions witnessed the object materialize from nowhere, saying, One of my buddies was outside. He was looking at the sky and said it just kind of appeared out of nowhere. And we all came out and looked, and then slowly, like 50 plus people started coming out looking. Those lights appeared out of nowhere. Hey, he said it twice. He was adamant. He added that despite their military experience, none of the Marines could recognize the craft, and described their reaction as you guessed it, baffled. Now, this man who filmed and photographed the object said, If you look at the picture, you can see a black triangular shape. But the picture I took with the black triangular shape underneath the lights, it's definitely not any type of flare thing or illumination rounds. The witness said the apparent object remained stationary for approximately 10 minutes. But also, like a Marine can be overheard on one of the videos saying that the triangle might have been in motion. Another Marine who saw it was serving as an artillery man at the base when he saw the UFO. He firmly rejected any suggestions that the lights could be attributed to illumination rounds that could have been, you know, sent off by artillery or any other mundane explanation he might have recognized, saying, This was something none of us had ever seen before. It was a completely different color. The size and the illumination was different. He explained that when they fire off illumination rounds, it's one. You send it in the air and let it drop, and then you send off another one. This was like five next to each other, and they're kind of reddish, and our usual illumination rounds are a yellow-white color. The UFO's disappearance, just as illumination rounds were fired over it, adds a layer of mystery. Helicopters and a massive military convoy swiftly converged on the scene, leaving us to ponder what exactly was the government's involvement in all this. The parallels between this and Phoenix Lights are undeniable. Both incidents feature large triangular objects with lights, hovering over military facilities, and then inexplicably vanishing. It's a real head-scratcher. And as more details emerge, it's clear that NASA and other space agencies will need to address the growing body of evidence related to these unidentified aerial phenomena. Which is something I've been saying for, you know, how many months have I been here again? Number four, the Go Fast video. So this video uploaded by the UFO investigative group to the STARS Academy of Arts and Sciences in March of 2018 was secured by a Freedom of Information Act request to the US government. The video was taken in 2015 off of the East Coast by an FA-18F fighter jet using the aircraft's onboard Raytheon AN-ASQ-228 Advanced Targeting Forward Looking Infrared Pod, also known as ATF LIR. I know myself too well, I'm gonna trip over my tongue if I try saying that more than once, so it should be called ATF for short. ATF is designed to allow pilots to track, target, and destroy targets on the ground at ranges of up to 40 miles. Now, it should be noted that ATF is good at spotting, but not engaging aerial targets. The video, nicknamed Go Fast, My To The Stars, starts by explaining the various numbers and symbols that appear in the footage. Things like the aircraft's altitude, which was around 25,000 feet, and the fact that the ATF was pointed ahead and to the left of the Super Hornet. The readout also explains that the aircraft was traveling at 252 knots, and in a five degree turn, and the unknown object is approximately 4.4 nautical miles away. The video shows the Super Hornet's weapon system operator repeatedly trying to acquire the UFO with the ATF's built-in auto tracker, which can, you know, pick out an object and keep it centered on camera. After two tries, the weapon system officer, or WSO, shouts, whoa, got it, to which another person, assumed to be the pilot, says, woohoo, whoa, not to sound like Mario or anything. What the bleep is that thing, the pilot asks. The WSO later says, oh my gosh, dude, to which the pilot replies, whoa. What is that, man? Now, yes, this is where skeptics might start asking, but Alexa, how is this unknown object different from weird government aircrafts we don't know about? Well, doubters, let me count thy ways. For starters, the UFO does not have any kind of hot exhaust trail that would be emitted by a conventional turbine engine, appearing to emit no heat on the ATF sensor. And secondly, the UFO doesn't have any visible wings or fins. 
Through my research, I've learned that even cruise missiles, such as the American Tomahawk or Russian Caliber, have small winglets that should be visible, and other missiles, such as the Maverick anti tank missile, have stubby fins. The UFO appears oval like and does not appear to fly nose first in the direction of travel. So, once again, this was a video hidden and released by the government, so uh, NASA, any comment? In our number three spot today, we have the Lubbock incident. On August 25th, 1951, in Lubbock, Texas, a group of scientists from the Texas Technical College were all hanging out in the backyard of geology professor Dr. W. I. Robinson. They were all just chilling, enjoying each other's company, until around 9.20 p.m. when they saw something very strange. It was a V-shaped formation of 15 to 30 bluish green lights passing overhead. They were completely confused over what it could be, but figured that the lights would likely reappear, which they did. About an hour later, the lights reappeared, and at this point, all these scientists knew that they had witnessed something exceptionally interesting, but what was it? The scientists weren't the only ones to witness the lights either. About 350 miles away in Albuquerque, New Mexico, an employee of the Atomic Energy Commission's top secret Sandia Corporation, who had a high level Q security clearance, had been sitting outside with his wife, quote, gazing at the night sky, commenting on how beautiful it was, when both of them were startled at the sight of a huge airplane flying swiftly and silently over their home. On the aft edge of the wings, there were six to eight pairs of soft, glowing bluish lights. There were more sightings as well, all reporting a similar thing. The group of scientists began investigating, tracking the lights, which they witnessed 12 more times. They measured the angle of the lights, they tracked the speed, and they attempted unsuccessfully to try and measure the UFO's altitude. Here's the deal with this though. The government did end up investigating, but the official explanation for these lights is the most cryptic message I've ever seen. It read, quote, I thought that the professor's lights might have been some kind of birds reflecting the light from mercury vapor street lights, but I was wrong. They weren't birds. They weren't refracted light, but they weren't spaceships. The lights that the professor saw have been positively identified as a very commonplace and easily explainable natural phenomena. I can't divulge exactly the way the answer was found because it is an interesting story of how a scientist set up complete instrumentation to track down the lights. Telling the story would lead to his identity and in exchange for his story, I promised the man complete anonymity. Despite people claiming that the mystery has been solved by this explanation, people are left with a lot more questions than answers. In our number two spot today, we have the Shag Harbor incident. This UFO encounter is often referred to as Canada's Roswell, so I was shocked that I hadn't heard of it before. Basically, this incident took place on October 4th, 1967, when an unknown object crashed into the water near Shag Harbor, which is a tiny town in Nova Scotia. There were at least 11 people who witnessed this object as it crashed, and many people claimed to have heard a whistling sound followed by a loud bang when the crash took place. The witnesses that claimed to have seen the UFO were all doing a bunch of different things at the time. One couple was just sitting on their porch, but the two witnesses that really get me are a flight pilot and a ship captain. On Air Canada Flight 305, First Officer Robert Ralph pointed out to Captain Pierre Charbonneau that there was something strange at the left side of the aircraft. They reported an object tracking along on a parallel course a few miles away and described it as a brilliantly lit rectangular object with a string of smaller lights trailing the object. Shortly after after they first noticed it, there was a large but silent explosion near the unknown object, and then two minutes later there was a second explosion, but this one faded to a blue cloud. As for the ship captain, Captain Leo Howard Mercy, he saw four blips on his DECA radar that were totally stationary. This led to him looking up to the sky, and that is when he saw four bright objects sitting in a rectangular formation about 28 kilometers from the vessel's window. He wasn't the only one who saw it on board, the entire crew of nearly 20 fishermen stood on deck and watched. A man named Lori Wickens was another one of the witnesses and he and some of his friends ended up calling the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, because they saw a huge object floating in the Atlantic Ocean about a thousand feet off of the shore. This is all super weird and not only the RCMP, but also the Royal Canadian Navy and the Royal Canadian Air Force became involved in investigation, but nothing was ever recovered or found, but it was also revealed that all commercial, private and military aircrafts along the eastern seaboard were accounted for, so what could have all these witnesses seen? Since they have never officially identified what it was in the official Government of Canada documents, it is listed as a UFO. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have the Westall Incident. Taking it back to 1966,
1996, we have the largest mass UFO sighting in Australia that at the time was largely ignored. This incident took place when over 300 students and staff members of a school in Melbourne all witnessed multiple UFOs silently flying through the air before they landed in a nearby field. While there's been a ton of speculation about this incident in the many years it's been, one witness account stands out among the rest, and that is the account made by the science teacher from the school, Andrew Greenwood. He was alerted to the UFO event by a hysterical student, and when he went outside to see for himself, everything changed. Previously a skeptic of UFO stories, Andrew's mind was abruptly changed when he saw, as he described it, a round silver object about the size of a car with a metal rod sticking up in the air. He went on to explain that suddenly, five planes came and surrounded the object, all while more people were gathering to watch. He called what happened next the most amazing flying he has ever seen, explaining that quote, every time they got too close to the object it would slowly accelerate, then rapidly accelerate, and then move away from them and stop. Then they would take off after it again, and the same thing would happen. This went on for about 20 minutes before the mysterious object just vanished. As weird as this all was, what was almost weirder was what happened next. Firstly, the headmaster of the school is said to have tried to put a stop to anyone talking about the incident at all, threatening severe punishment to any student or staff who was caught speaking about it, and when the Royal Australian Air Force contacted him, he refused to talk to them at all about it. There have also been stories of witnesses getting visits from people warning them not to speak of the incident. Andrew explained, quote, when he asked the physical education teacher to describe what she had seen herself so that he could compare it with his own observation, she just wouldn't say anything. Another witness who did talk to Andrew and described what she had seen in great detail, just 30 minutes later refused to speak to him and wouldn't say a word. Was this because of the threats from the headmaster? Or was something else going on here? This is definitely one strange UFO story that leaves behind a lot of questions. Number 5. Alright, the 2019 Jackson Spotting. Folks, we are starting today off with the usual disclaimer that if the footage or photos that I'm talking about don't appear, it's because they've disappeared from the interwebs between when I did my research and when this hits the World Wide Web. Which honestly, in my personal opinion, leads me to believe we're on the right track to the point where the men in black are watching or I just have the worst luck. 50-50. So in August of 2019, an intriguing video surfaced on the internet raising questions that uh, NASA can't easily dismiss. The footage sent to Buckrail website by an anonymous reader shows a mysterious flying object over Jackson Hole, which is located in Wyoming by the way. I thought it was in Florida. This unidentified phenomenon occurred during the Perside meteor shower, but it exhibited peculiar characteristics that challenged conventional explanations. The anonymous observer, working a night shift, initially thought it might be a meteor, but it moved way too slow and seemingly too close to the ground for that. So after checking flight records, no aircrafts were reported in that airspace at that time. And what truly baffled the observer was a sudden brilliant flash at the end of the object's trajectory, illuminating the sky. Such an occurrence defied conventional wisdom, leading to the tongue-in-cheek speculation of aliens in their sleep deprived state. Hey, after analyzing the video frame by frame, experts ruled out meteors due to the object's brightness and slow movement, which lacked the characteristic streak of meteors. Some suggested it could be a drone, as drones, as drone regulations were Require visible lights, but the unknown flash remains unexplained. Michael Brotherton, a professor of astronomy, noted that the flash might not appear as bright in reality, considering the sensitivity of webcams to low light. A former Air Force pilot proposed the theory of a single ship fighter jet, possibly performing maneuvers with afterburners and flares. However, the absence of military training airspace in the area and the unusual time for a solo jet flight raised as many doubts. In conclusion, the mystery persists, with the leading explanations being a drone or a lone fighter jet. But the peculiar flash remains unaccounted for, leaving us with our unanswered questions. Was it actually a drone pilot's curiosity, a pilot's showboating, or UFOs? This footage continues to baffle experts, and uh, yeah, it raises a lot of questions. So let me know in the comments what you think, because my brain is confounded. Number 4. The Varginha Incident The Brazil's Roswell Incident, known as the, we're gonna call it the V case, has resurfaced, igniting intrigue and sparking rumors of potential creature footage. Back in 1996, so the year before I was born, this incident garnered global attention, featuring a UFO crash, an alleged extraterrestrial encounter, and a subsequent military cover-up, despite official government denials. This enigma remains one of Brazil's most famous UFO cases, drawing UFO tourism to the city of V. Witnesses recounted a bizarre event in that January, when a strange, cigar-shaped object crashed in, yep, the city of V. Locals observed its gradual descent, describing it as resembling a struggling washing machine. The incident was followed by the arrival of military personnel who cordoned off the area. Now, subsequently, a group of girls claimed to have encountered 
encountered a strange creature with brown, oily skin, V shaped feet, a large head, and huge red eyes. The Brazilian military later attributed this creature to a homeless man covered in mud, but the witnesses vehemently disagreed. They recalled the creature's fearful expression and alien characteristics, leading them to believe it was not a human or an animal. The mystery deepened when two military police officers reportedly captured the creature, only for one of them to suffer a fatal infection shortly afterwards. Now, the documentary that was recently. The recent documentary, Moment of Contact, has reignited interest in the case, featuring interviews with witnesses and an anonymous whistleblower known as Military X. This whistleblower claimed to have been involved in transporting the creature's body to the ESA Army base. His description of the creature's oily skin and V-shaped foot only added to the mystery and credibility. Additionally, a former Brazilian Air Force traffic controller alleged that the U.S. Air Force landed unannounced and dispatched helicopters to collect something in the city of V. The documentary concludes with the filmmakers pursuing video and photographic evidence, suggesting that such evidence exists somewhere in Brazil. Now, this incident occurred in a climate of increased UFO attention, both in Brazil and internationally. But with witnesses and whistleblowers sharing their accounts and claims of photographic evidence, the mystery of Brazil's Roswell remains a captivating enigma, challenging official explanations and leaving room for speculation and, you know, yeah. Hey NASA, any comment on this cover up? I'm not expecting it, but it'd be nice. Number three, Las Vegas aliens. Wanna go gambling? One sighting this year in Las Vegas shows shadowy figures lurking somewhere in the shot. You can watch the creepy footage, you know, and see if you can spot them. This video is one of many supposed UFO sightings in Vegas just this year, with another sighting around the incident even involving police officer. But this particular video shows a group of people looking kind of nervous as they look into a backyard behind a house, with the camera zooming in on a forklift truck which has shadowy figures looking inside. Now, there was a fair bit of confusion over where the extraterrestrials are in the video, but many people insist they're there, including me. For example, one comment wrote, you can see their face, eyes glowing in the first tractor. Then look at the second one, you can see it peaking, they're on like 8 to 10 feet tall. Another wrote, face a little left of the center of the circle, you can see the eyes and the mouth. So this video could offer fresh insight into the um, plethora of encounters and sightings that Vegas has recently seen. Police body cam footage emerged in June, showing lights hovering in the sky before plummeting to the ground in a suspected UFO crash landing sighting. Officers carried out an extensive search following reports of the mysterious figures, with no new evidence being uncovered. However, an eyewitness to the suspected crash landing spoke out and claimed they witnessed the whole thing, and even stumbled across an extraterrestrial. Apparently my brother told me to look behind the forklift, and I did. I saw the alien creature. So when I saw it, it was a tall, skinny, lengthy creature, according to this YouTuber. He was a gray, greenish color, and when I looked it in the eyes, my whole body just froze. Bear in mind, I'm looking at his whole body. He has weird looking feet and a big face and eyes. Yes, there could be numerous theories about the existence of alien life. Many people believe that the universe is simply too big for us to be alone, no matter how unlikely life is to develop. And with that, one theory about why we haven't encountered aliens is that we are being snubbed by the galactic community, either because we're too stupid or too nasty, which like, mm, fair. Another interesting idea is that intelligent life has evolved several times in the universe. However, the lifespan of an intelligent civilization compared to the universe as a whole is so relatively short that intelligent civilizations might never have coexisted as one goes extinct before another emerges. Let me know in the comments what your theories are. Number two, CBP footage. US Customs and Border Protection, so CBP for short, quietly released a slew of records and videos of UFOs in August of this year. Specifically, 12 videos, which were released in response to a Freedom of Information Act request, all of which allegedly contained footage of UFOs. Now all the footage is available for download and is accompanied by a UFO report titled The Pentagon's UAP Task Force, Midi Security and Police Studies Number 183. The report is an older document said to be written by Frank Milburn and had something to do with the Began Sadat Center for Strategic Studies at the Bar Olan University. It's unclear precisely what the report has to do with the videos, which are pretty stunning on their own. One of the videos clearly shows an orb flying in close proximity to a plane to the point where it appears the orb is chasing the plane through the sky. It's clear the object isn't moving like any other craft known to man. Most of the footage appears to show some type of orb following an aircraft or flying over land, and in one particular video, we can see one of these super fast objects glide over what appears to be some type of urban development or military base. So what are these orbs? We have no idea. They've shown up consistently around army installations and seem particularly fascinated with military activity. But other than that, we're still none the wiser as to what the heck is going on in our skies. The videos, some of which leaked already a few years back, have added fuel to the already raging fire of public discourse around flying saucers. One video in particular from 2013 shows an unidentifiable spot flying over an airport. The video is black and white and the footage is a little grainy, and the object, whatever it is, cruises over the airport at what appears to be a consistent rate, on a path taking it towards the ocean. It doesn't 
doesn't look at all that unusual. Like if you had already told me it was a bird or a small, you know, UAP, I'd believe it. But the trouble starts when it gets near the water and appears to change shape. Shortly thereafter, the object seems to disappear, reappear, and then vanish for good. Some folks have interpreted that as the object having dipped beneath the water and emerged again, seemingly without losing any speed, which would be an impressive engineering achievement. But the video is so poor, it could just as easily be a digital artifact. Look, we filled the space around us with a growing number of cameras and orbiting satellites, and they're recording all the time. More than that, we as humans are creating more technology, some of which isn't public knowledge. It was probably inevitable that we would start to catch things on camera that we can't explain. But there's a pretty big gap between, look at that weird thing, and uh, I bet it came from across the stars. Still. There is some weird stuff going on in the sky, and hey NASA, we should probably devote some resources to figuring out what it is. With that in mind though, apparently Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and Senator Mike Rounds introduced an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act, which would establish a structure for how and when UAP documents would be released to the public. So for example, for decades, many Americans have been fascinated by, you know, what the heck's out there, and it's long past time they got some answers. The Americans, Canadians, everybody has a right to learn about technologies of unknown origins, non-human intelligence, and unexplainable phenomena. So apparently we're not only working to declassify what the government has previously learned about these, you know, phenomena, but also to create a pipeline for future research to be made public. The bill requires that the government agencies turn over any UAP information they possess within 300 days of the act going into effect. All of which is to say we're at least like a year and a half out from seeing the extraterrestrial goods, so I'm going to keep screaming at NASA if you don't mind. Number 1. George Arteaga footage So over the last year, if you couldn't tell by today, unexplainable objects have been appearing in the sky baffling a lot of folks, especially pilots. So some pilots believe that these fast orbiting objects aren't satellites or known military aircraft. Specifically, pilot George Ateaga remembers the event of what he claims was the most frightening experience of his life, where a circular object flew directly in front of his plane and whizzed directly by his window. He and his co-pilot Daniel were flying towards Medellin when they noticed a strange object. Now thankfully our pilot was able to turn his plane around and the unidentified object moved towards them. He also caught the first video of the stationary object. He was able to fly past the object. And he doesn't think it was a balloon because ideally the wind from the plane should have blown it away. The pilot believes that whatever he saw was once again not a balloon by any measure as he was way too high up and it was way too cold for a balloon to float free. Soon after he posted the video on Twitter, it was uploaded by an Instagram handle named The Hood's Finest and the video went viral and viewers speculated that uh, what he saw was definitely a UFO. The pilot claims the aircraft was traveling at a speed of 300 kilometers an hour with temperatures falling close to uh, around 5 and in those conditions, mistaking a balloon or a bird for a UFO is very unlikely. Once again, hey NASA, wanna weigh in? In fifth place, we have the 2004 series of spottings. On November 14th of 2004, Lieutenant Alex Dietrich was piloting her FA-18 Super Hornet when she observed an oblong object hovering over the water. It leapt into motion, skimming 500 to 1,000 feet over the waves at around 500 knots. The fighter jet's onboard radar couldn't detect the object, but Alex's weapon system operator in the rear seat, whose name is not public, witnessed it as well. Alex has quoted her recollection as, We were trying to call out what we were seeing to each other and to make sure everybody else is seeing it. It's moving so erratically and so fast that our voices, our minds, and our radio calls just can't keep up with it. Now, the majority of credible modern day UFO sightings ergo why it's on this list, can be credited to those that work in the Air Force. And it should be noted that military pilots specifically are trained at what they call RIS, short for reconnaissance, and referring more specifically in this case to the art of recognizing aircrafts by their shapes, paint schemes, unit insignia, and more. On one of the other Super Hornets that launched behind Alex was Lieutenant Commander Chad Underwood, who was able to capture the object on an infrared camera. It was around 40 feet long, round and smooth, and quickly received the nickname Tic Tac. Now all of the footage that the US government has confirmed as authentic and unexplained speak for itself since I know we have the clip handy. Around this time, starting on November 10th to be exact, Gary Forhees, a petty officer on the USS Princeton guided missile cruiser, had been reporting apparitions on his radar screens in the same area, triple checking his equipment before he made his report, and being the main technician responsible for that equipment, along with having six years of Navy experience at the time, Forhees described what he was seeing as impossible. In just seconds, an object had dropped to the waterline from 60,000 feet, hovered, and then zipped away at high velocity, making right angle turns that were quoted as being confounding and and defying gravity. I'm not Alphaba. The objects returned for the next week, with Voorhees quoted as saying, I was able to see it on the horizon during the night and during the day, and it definitely was a glowing object. Could I tell you for 100% certainty what it was exactly we were tracking? No. Now, footage of this event used to exist, with Gary being able to vividly describe his memories, but has since been completely scrapped from the internet. Just gonna give the Pentagon my usual dose of side eye right about now. 
Don't mind me. In fourth place, we have the Washington Flap. At 11.40 p.m. on Saturday, July 19th of 1952, Edward Nugent, an air traffic controller at the Ronald Reagan Washington National Airport, try saying that five times fast, spotted seven objects on his radar. The objects were around 24 kilometers south-southwest of the city, not following any established flight paths, and no known aircrafts were in the area. Edward's superior, Harry Barnes, a senior air traffic controller at the airport, watched the objects on the radar scope later writing that they knew immediately that a very strange situation existed. Their movements were completely radical compared to those of any ordinary aircraft. Harry had two controllers check Edward's radar, and they found it was working normally. He then called the National Airport's radar-equipped control tower, and the controllers there said that they also had unidentified blips on their radar screen, and saw a hovering bright light in the sky that was moving at speeds they couldn't understand. At this point, other objects appeared in all sectors of the radar scope, and when they moved over the White House and the United States Capitol, Harry then called the Andrews Air Force Base, which was located around 10 miles away. Although they reported that they had no unusual objects on their radar, an airman soon called the base's control tower to report the sighting of a strange object. Airman William Brady, who was in the tower, saw an object which appeared to be like an orange ball of fire, trailing a tail, saying it was unlike anything he had ever seen before. Where have I said that already? As William tried to alert the other personnel in the tower, the strange object took off at an unbelievable speed. On one of the National Airport's runways, pilot S.C. Pierman was waiting in the cockpit of his plane for permission to take off. After spotting what he believed to be a meteor, he was told that the control tower's radar had detected unknown objects closing in on his position. Pierman observed six objects that he described as white, tailless, fast-moving lights over a 14-minute period. He was in radio contact with Harry during his sighting, and Harry later reported that each sighting coincided with a pip that could be seen near his plane. When he reported that the light streaked off at a high speed, it disappeared on the scope. Meanwhile, back at the Andrews Air Force Base, Staff Sergeant Charles Davenport observed an orange-red light to the south where the light would appear to stand still, then make an abrupt change in direction and altitude, with the phenomena happening over several times. At one point, both radar centers at National Airport and the radar at Andrews Air Force Base were tracking an object hovering over a radio beacon. The object vanished in all three radar centers at the same time. At 3 a.m., shortly before two United States Air Force F-94 Starfire jet fires from Newcastle Air Force Base in Delaware arrived over Washington, all of the objects vanished from the radar at National Airport. However, when the jets ran low on fuel and left, the objects returned, which convinced Harry that the UFOs were monitoring radio traffic and behaving accordingly. The objects were last detected by radar at 5.30 a.m. Now, the government later tried dismissing the events of that day on a temperature blip, but those who were present have been adamant otherwise. Number three, Japanese British crossover event. I swear, I know that sounds like something out of an anime, but I promise you it's very, very real. The 2011 British government release of 8,500 pages of secret UFO reports, yep, 8,500, rekindled interest in UFO sightings and their possible connection to world crises. The reports point to a curious pattern of increased UFO sightings during times of significant events, such as natural disasters or um, wartime. In the aftermath of the devastating 8.9 magnitude earthquake in Japan, y'all remember that one, there had actually been numerous UFO sightings reported over the country, with video footage showing bright lights in the sky and UFOs skimming over the Pacific near the quake zones. One notable incident involved a rare air defense video from Japan showing a UFO flying near the nuclear-powered aircraft carrier USS Ronald Reagan as it arrived off Japan's coast to assist with disaster response. These sightings have sparked discussions and speculations about the connection between UFOs and global events. The British UFO files also reference American UFO researcher Dr. Joseph Allen Hynek, who served as a consultant to the American Defense Department department for about 15 years. The files suggest that Hynek's studies on world disasters and their relation to increased UFO sightings were influential in the UFO community. This correlation between significant events and UFO sightings raises um, some questions. I know I have plenty. The release of these files from, you know, the release of these files has shed light on the government's long-standing secrecy regarding UFO information, with accusations that people who reported UFO sightings were often ridiculed or dismissed. Furthermore, and uh, hold on to your butts folks, it has been revealed that discussions about UFO phenomenon took place at the highest levels of government worldwide. Like in 1979, the House of Lords held the first full debate among lawmakers on the subject, acknowledging thousands of credible UFO sightings reported by British police, government officials, and members of the Royal Air Force. The role of the House of Lords in keeping these UFO findings secret for over 60 years has raised many questions about the transparency of government institutions. Eh, you don't say. Additionally, the British media has criticized the Ministry of Defense for labeling people who reported UFOs as nutters, while the House of Lords and even the Queen of England had knowledge of the secret UFO files. Yeah, you heard me correctly. The Queen knew about this and was just like, hmm, nah. 
Interestingly, the UFO files also mention the detection of 15 UFOs on radar approaching the United Kingdom on the day of September 11th. Yeah, of 2001. Remember that? Adding another layer of mystery to this phenomenon. These revelations from the British government's release of the files have ignited some discussions about uh, have ignited some discussions worldwide about the intersection of UFO sightings, major world events, and government secrecy, prompting uh, further questions. I know I have plenty. Number two, Gulf Breeze footage. So the Gulf Breeze UFO incident, a series of claimed UFO sightings in Gulf Breeze, Florida, during 1970 during 1987 to 1988, remains a puzzling chapter in the history of UFOlogy. Or is it UFOlogy? Please let me know in the comments. At the heart of this curious tale is Ed Walters, a local contractor who reported numerous UFO encounters and provided photographs as evidence. This case drew significant attention from UFO researchers, skeptics, and the general public. In November of 1987, Ed captured attention by supplying photos of alleged UFO sightings to the Gulf Breeze Sentinel newspaper. These images, published under aliases to protect Walter's identity, showed a mysterious craft in the skies above Gulf Breeze. Now, some experts, like Bruce McAbee, believed the photographs to be genuine. Walter's own accounts of his experiences are intriguing, yet highly controversial. He reported being immobilized by a blue beam and took Polaroid photos of the UFO hovering above his home. He claimed to encounter the craft multiple times and even reported it seeing land and aliens stepping out. He said the alien he said the aliens communicated with him telepathically and presented him with a book of dog pictures. And then a blue beam of light lifted him off the ground. Hey, sounds straight straightforward to me. These extraordinary claims were supported by some, including a polygraph test that indicated Walters believed his photos were real. UFO researcher Bud Hopkins also interviewed Walters and believed in his authenticity, citing the fact that Walters turned down a significant book deal and once again passed a polygraph test. Granted, there were some strong skeptics. Ray Stanford, a paranormal investigator, focused on the background of the photos and was convinced they were hoaxes. In addition, another UFO investigator, Philip Class, thought the photos were inauthentic and not impressive to the public. And yes, somebody from NASA also raised some questions about the double exposure. We all know about that though. It's pretty easy to fake that. I don't think these were faked. Even within Gulf Breeze, the Gulf Breeze Sentinel's publication of the photos did lead to uh, numerous reported sightings in the area. Locals described various UFO phenomena, including some glowing stuff, beams of light, and a craft. The Gulf Breeze case had become a significant topic of discussion in the UFO community at the time. Once again, it's going to remain shrouded in mystery and controversy. Ed's claims and the accompanying photographs kind of divided some opinions. I'm on team that uh, it's compelling evidence. It's real. Number one, the Arctic UAP. So the recent surge in reports of unidentified flying objects, or now known as UAPs, has brought the question of extraterrestrial life into the forefront of public consciousness once again. A recent incident involving a Chinese spy balloon over the US and subsequent unexplained aerial phenomena kind of raises some concerns and questions about what on earth is happening in our skies. So let's go back to February of this year when uh, there was an incident that marked a series of mysterious aerial events. Let's go back to February of this year when there was a series of mysterious aerial events which captured our attention. It all began with the massive Chinese surveillance balloon that meandered across North America. This intrusion into US airspace prompted the use of military force to bring it down, leaving many Americans in disbelief that such an event could occur. What followed were three more perplexing incidents. What followed were three more perplexing incidents involving unknown objects. US fighters um, took down these objects over various locations, including Alaska, the Yukon here in Canada, and Michigan's Lake Huron. The fact that authorities admitted to having no idea about the origin or ownership of these objects deepens the mystery. However, it's the revelation of a fifth undisclosed incident. However, it's the revelation of a fifth undisclosed incident over the Arctic Circle on February 1st that truly raises some eyebrows. The involvement of eight or nine UAPs detected over the Arctic led to the deployment of fighter jets in an attempt to intercept them. Now, these objects exhibited high-speed maneuvering, eluding the pursuit of military aircraft. Former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense Christopher Mellon corroborated this account. It's a clear indication of a larger issue: the lack of transparency and information from the Air Force regarding UAPs. Popular outlet News Nation reached out to both the Pentagon and NORAD, but the responses didn't provide satisfactory answers. NORAD denied allegations of scrambling fighter jets to intercept UAPs, attributing aircraft presence in the area to a training operation. Also, there's an unsettling silence surrounding the Alaska object come down on February 10th. Despite the White House's assurances that debris recovery efforts would be made, none of that was happening. So are these advanced technologies, espionage activities, or something beyond our current understanding? Now come on, I can't be the only one getting a bad case of deja vu with this one. This is almost textbook with what the government did to cover up the Roswell case for years. First off, Pentagon's UFO traffic efforts still find no alien origins. We're starting off with some revelations from the Pentagon. The head of their UFO incidents investigation office has testified 
to Congress, and it seems they've got 650 cases on their hands right now. And before you ask, apparently they've found no evidence of extraterrestrial life yet, or at least that's what they want us to believe. Right in the middle of a rare open congressional hearing on what the Pentagon is calling unexplained anomalous phenomena, or UAPs, they've dropped two new videos. They wanted to show how the newly formed All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, or AARO, can explain some of these weird occurrences but is left scratching their heads at others. Now, I want to know, have you ever had a close encounter or spotted something in the sky that you just couldn't explain? Maybe you've seen strange lights, unusual shapes, or even alien creatures in real life? Share your experience in the comments. The first video which is up on the Pentagon's website is in color and dates back to July 12, 2022 in the Middle East. The second one gives us two different views of an incident reported over South Asia on January 15, 2023. The testimony from Kirkpatrick revealed that the AARO is currently reviewing over 650 UAP incidents. That's quite a leap from the 510 the US intelligence community reported in the last UAP report back in January. While the Pentagon has yet to officially recognize these UAPs as evidence of extraterrestrial life, numerous aspects of these videos have intrigued UFO enthusiasts and theorists alike who believe these could indeed be alien encounters. The truth behind these UAPs remains elusive and the investigations by AARO are ongoing, yet these intriguing points leave us with more questions than answers. On to the next! For decades, our fascination with extraterrestrial and non-human life has been ignited by Hollywood's sci-fi movies. But today, that enthusiasm is stoked by something far more intriguing, authentic video footage released by none other than the US government. For many years, the idea of life beyond Earth has been a topic of fascination and speculation. From aliens in green spacesuits and giant spaceships, Hollywood has provided us with endless entertainment when it comes to extraterrestrial beings. However, it wasn't until recently that our curiosity was piqued by actual footage released by the US government. The release of authentic video footage showcasing unidentified aerial phenomena, or UAPs, has caused a stir in the scientific community and among the general public. People are now asking questions about what these objects could be and whether they hold any significance for life beyond our planet. A former Navy pilot who has had first-hand experiences with UAP shared his own encounters and sheds light on the government's investigations into these mysterious flying objects. His advocacy for more government transparency and openness regarding UAP sightings adds another layer to already fascinating topic. So if a Navy pilot is advocating for transparency, that must mean he's seen otherworldly things, right? That's spooky to think about considering how little the government keeps from us about extraterrestrial life. Next up, we're diving into an incident involving another UAP. Picture this, an entity with an uncanny resemblance to a jellyfish effortlessly gliding through a high security military site before moving over a body of water. Now here's where things get interesting. This UAP then started a calculated descent, submerging itself beneath the water surface. But that's not all. After a suspenseful 17 minutes, this thing resurfaced and darted off into the distance at an incredible speed. Now, according to those who have seen the full footage or were present during this event, this UAP was completely invisible to night vision. Even more bizarre, it seemed to interfere with the targeting capabilities of the optical platform. But perhaps the most intriguing part is it demonstrated a form of positive lift, an ability to hover in the air without any visible means of lift or thrust. No propulsion maneuvers, no signatures, nothing. This incident is just one of many that have been reported and documented by credible sources, raising questions about whether we are alone in this vast universe. But the release of the Pentagon's report on UAPs, the topic has gained even more attention and sparked a renewed interest in the search for ET life. Some theories suggest that these UAPs could be advanced technology from other countries, while others believe they are of extraterrestrial origin. The truth is, we can't definitively say what these objects are or where they come from, but what we do know is that their capabilities far surpass our current technological advancements. One possible explanation for the advanced technology displayed by UAPs is that they are using propulsion systems based on principles beyond our understanding. Another theory suggests that these objects are able to manipulate space-time, allowing them to travel vast distances in a short amount of time. But perhaps the most unsettling thought is that these UAPs could be controlled by intelligent beings who possess knowledge and abilities far beyond our own. 
one. If this is true, it raises important questions about our place in the universe and how we should approach the possibility of contact with extraterrestrial life. Continuing our exploration of UAPs, there's another often discussed theories. Some researchers propose that these unidentified objects could be evidence of time travelers from our own future. While this certainly ventures into the realm of science fiction, considering the far superior technological advancement displayed by these UAPs, theory that cannot be dismissed outright. In third place, we have the Go Faster video. The video, uploaded by the UFO Investigative Group to the STARS Academy of Arts and Sciences in March of 2018, was secured by a Freedom of Information Act request to the US government. The video was taken in 2015 off of the East Coast by an FA-18F fighter jet using the aircraft's onboard Raytheon AN-ASQ-228 Advanced Targeting Forward-Looking Infrared Pod, also known as the ATFLIR. I know myself too well. I'll trip over my tongue if I try saying that any more than I just did, so it shall be called ATF for short. It's not the official short form, but work with me here. ATF is designed to allow pilots to track, target, and destroy targets on the ground at ranges of up to 40 miles. It should be noted that ATF is good at spotting, but not engaging aerial targets. Now this video, nicknamed Go Fast by To The Stars, starts by explaining the various numbers and symbols that appear in the footage. You know, things like the aircraft's altitude, which was around 25,000 feet, and the fact that the ATF was pointed ahead and to the left of the Super Hornet. The readout also explains that the aircraft was traveling at 252 knots and in a 5 degree turn, and the unknown object was approximately 4.4 nautical miles away. The video shows the Super Hornet's weapon system operator repeatedly trying to acquire the UFO with the ATF's built-in auto tracker, which can pick out an object and keep it centered on camera. After two tries, the weapon system officer, or WSO for short, shouts, whoa, got it, to which another person assumed to be the pilot says, Woohoo! Woo! What the bleep is that thing? The pilot asks. The WSO later says, Oh my gosh, dude. To which the pilot replies, Whoa, what is that man? Now, this is where the skeptics would start asking, But Alexa, how is this unknown object different from, you know, weird government aircrafts we don't know about? Well, doubters, let me count to thy ways. For starters, the UFO doesn't have any kind of hot exhaust trail that would be emitted by a conventional turbine engine, appearing to emit, you know, no heat on the ATF sensor. And secondly, the UFO doesn't have any visible wings or fins. Through my research, I've learned that even, like, cruise missiles, such as the American Tomahawk, have small winglets that should be visible and other missiles such as the Maverick anti-tank missile still have little stubby fins. The UFO appears oval-like and does not appear to fly nose first in the direction of travel. To quote from one of my favorite films, take that Mr. Downing Mustafa. In second place, we have the Aguadilla UAP. Jonathan Lace, spokesman for the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies, SE for short, explains that the organization believes the most compelling footage of anomalous activity ever taken was by a Homeland Security aircraft over Puerto Rico on April 25th of 2013. I'll let you folks make up your own minds in the comments. but. Let's get at it. The video was captured at around 9.20 p.m. on that fateful day as an unknown object flew across the runway of the Rafael Hernandez Airport in Aguadilla and was caught on infrared camera by a U.S. Customs and Border Protection aircraft, the footage of which was leaked to the SEU by an anonymous source. The eerie footage shows an object believed to be up to 5 feet in length, moving at speeds of up to 120 miles per hour, get close to the ground before seemingly plunging into the ocean and splitting into two. In a 50-page report, the SEU has made notes that no bird, no balloon, no aircraft, and no known drones have that capability. It also appears to not disturb the water when plunging beneath and then re-emerging from the surface, a phenomenon known as transmedium travel. SCU investigators said that the object appears to be of unknown origin after spending a thousand hours researching the UAP in question. It is claimed that the pilots of a DHC-8 turboprop spotted a red light over the ocean. They then contacted the control tower who told them they did not know the identity of the object and then the object's lights went out as it approached the shore. The plane then engaged its thermal image camera and went on to follow the UAP. The SCU report concluded by saying that the video is the best documentation of an unknown aerial and submerged nautical object exhibiting advanced technology they've ever seen. They have since called for the release of more data from the Pentagon after the release of the Tic Tac, Gimbal, and Go Fast videos. In their statement, the SCU says that they believe that all government data regarding unidentified aerospace objects should be made available to the public to be openly investigated by the broader scientific community, provided that such data does not 
compromised sources or methods of data collection. Now, a full scientific investigation of such data would be able to uncover valuable information relating to both national security and advancement of our understanding of physics, aerospace engineering, and you know, our world and beyond. Here's to hoping the Pentagon lessens someday and releases that footage. If I've said it once, I've said it a million times. They just really need to stop being so cagey about what they release. They really don't release information unless they're forced to, and while I hate sounding like a broken record, they need to do better. And in first place, we have the Chicago O'Hare Airport sighting. At around 4.15 p.m. on November 7th of 2006, federal authorities at Chicago O'Hare's International Airport received a report that a group of 12 airport employees were witnessing a metallic, saucer-shaped craft hovering over gate C-17. The object was first spotted by a ramp employee who was pushing back United Airlines Flight 446, which was departing Chicago for Charlotte, North Carolina. The employee made the flight's crew aware of the mysterious object above their aircraft, and this unknown craft was also witnessed by, you know, pilots, airline management, and mechanics. So, a lot of people. No air traffic controllers saw the object though, and it didn't show up on radar. What this has described the object as completely silent, 6 to 24 feet in diameter, and dark gray in color. Several independent witnesses outside of the airport also saw this object. One described, you know, seeing a disc-shaped craft hovering over the airport, stating that it was obviously not clouds since the object shot through the clouds at a high velocity, leaving a clear blue hole in the cloud layer, which closed itself shortly after the events. According to a reporter at the Chicago Tribune, the disc was visible for approximately five minutes and was seen by close to a dozen United Airlines employees, ranging from, yep, pilots and supervisors who heard chatter on the radio and raced out to see it. Both United Airlines and the Federal Aviation Administration, FAA for short, initially denied that they had any information on this sighting until the Chicago Tribune filed a Freedom of Information Act request. The FAA then ordered an internal review of air traffic communications tapes to comply with the request, which, what do you know? uncovered a call by the United Supervisor to an FAA manager in the airport tower concerning the UFO sighting. If I haven't made myself obvious by now, I hate, 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 hate cover-ups, so I'm glad the Freedom of Information request was rightfully granted. UFO investigators have argued that the FAA's refusal to look into the incident contradicts the agency's mandate to investigate possible security breaches at American airports, such as in this case. The National Aviation Reporting Center on Anomalous Phenomena published a 155-page report on the sighting and has called for government inquiry and, you know, improved energy sensing techniques. Because if an airborne object can hover for several minutes over a busy airport, but not be registered on radar or seen visually from the control tower, this creates a potential threat to human safety.